Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Time, yeah, I'm, good, on, <laughs> I'm skating on the thinnest ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and on. I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Rob Gillespie, welcome to the Nash Off The Hook podcast, mate. How the devil are you? I'm good, mate. Pleased to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me round to, it's your mum's house that we've commandeered, isn't it? It is, yeah. Commandeered my mother's. <laughs> She's in Turkey, though, so it's all yeah, right. Yeah, We're not yeah. going to make her fall asleep by talking to her <laughs> carp stories all day. Um, you, your name, oh, I'm trying to think, the amount of top anglers that I've had on that have referenced you in some way or shape or form over the years. You are Northwest legend, big carp legend, but a man who in the last 15 years hasn't wet a line? No, it's, it's probably getting on for that. Is 2015, it? 2016, probably <sighs> last time. Jeez, yeah. mate. No fishing anymore? Not at the moment, no. Never say never. But you did angle, and this is what we're going to talk about, I would say, in the very top percentage of big carp fishing. I know you're very modest. I know you don't want to give it the big end, but I'm here to give it the big end for you because you've had some incredible chapters on some incredible venues and caught some incredible fish. And we're going to hear about it in detail as well. Plus, there's other aspects we're going to touch on. There was your bait. There was a lot of stuff around sort of your mindset, which is always a key thing when we talk about big carp hunting um, and the people that you met along the way. For you, mate, the the sort of more recent times we talked about you not fishing, what has been the sort of substitute passion-wise for angling? Well, as you probably know, climbing took over uh, about 2012 and then I transitioned into that from from the from the fishing really and uh, put the rods away for good so it seems <laughs> 2015 climbing mate what is it the same buzz as catching a big one uh definitely yeah yeah definitely get that that same uh adrenaline hit from it uh but just a hell of a lot quicker than than the carp fishing really it's funny you should say this i'm going to reference uh rob fearbold here who's one of the nash cameramen absolute boy he films the drop shoots with me and he has got into climbing and he said exactly the same thing. Rather than a big extended campaign of carp fishing where you get loads of time and then a real big hit of adrenaline and a buzz when you catch one, climbing, 45 minutes, on a wall, you're sort of scared for your life imminently, but you manage to do it, get down, and you get that same buzz. Yeah, yeah. And, and it takes you to beautiful places, same as carp fishing does, uh, but a little bit different, a little bit more mountainous at times. You'll get back behind the rods, Rob. You've got to, mate. Oh, maybe dust them off one day. They're uh, they're in the garage waiting. The carp angler's <laughs> always in there, mate. Um, we're going to start sort of your formative years. Now, we're in the Northwest. You are a Northwest legend. Talk to me about your sort of start because the area itself probably over a period of years has had coverage around sort of Reed's Mere and the likes of Free Frank's right in the media. But as a starting point for carp angling, there's a few people that have done it, but there's a lot of other angling on offers, a lot of match fishing. And generally it's very different as the sort of South scene and how people start there. So talk to me about your beginnings, mate. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, back in my day, you, I would like to think a lot of the Southern anglers were still starting float fishing and, mucking about on ponds, farm ponds, things like that. And, and that's where mine started, just going up from the local estate, it just into the fields, there'd be a farm pond, and we'd go up there float fishing, a few of the lads, and uh, catching small carp, you know, little fingerlings, and up to two, three pound, which seemed like giants then. Hmm. And and that's, we would, we'd have been eight, nine, ten years old, and that's where it took off, really. That's where uh, where the passion started, but we 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 spend a lot of time on 
wasting time as well. We, we, we loads of time blanking on other ponds, chucking laws in <laughs> lakes with no pike in, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, things yeah. like that. <laughs> the usual things you do as kids: cycling around on your bikes, finding little areas to fish, uh, and on the rivers, getting trout in areas where you're not meant to be. Yeah, nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah. From that sort of starting point, you've been quite spread outdoorsy, very much sort of at the time before sort of social media inf- influx of computer games and all that stuff. It was a very much an outdoor lifestyle. People were out. Fishing was quite en- easy to enter and sort of get into. And as mm. you say, you had a circle of people that were doing it with you. For you, how did that then morph into like the carp scene as you like? Where, where was that sort of, yeah, that moment where it became sort of, more targeted, more focused on, on carp. Where was that? Well, that, it was, uh, we'd gone through all the stage of fishing on the canals, float fishing for anything that came along. And I suppose the turning point would have been getting on Cape Thorn Stock Pond. It was all carp in there, lily pad covered pool. Uh, so you were just fishing at you know, lunch and meat, sweet corn, hot dog. <laughs> uh, burger used to be one of the best, uh, defrosted burger. <laughs> Was, uh, that was the killer bait on there. So it was all just carp there. And then you'd see people come on ledgering. And they'd be getting a few more takes, some of the bigger fish. And uh, so you'd do that. And then you'd progress into ledger fishing, which would be, you know, your carp fishing as it is today. Uh, and then we moved on to the main lake a couple of years later. Uh, about, I think we'd have been the age th- age 13. What year is this? Give me an idea. Uh, 93. 90s, okay. Yeah. Did you know at the time... 92, 93. Yeah. yeah. Did you know at the time that Cape Sorn Estate, Reedsmere, the likes of, did you know the sort of magnitude of those venues within the north in terms of carp, or was it just... Uh, no, we, we're too young. We, we knew that they were enormous fish, as far as we were concerned. Mm. Almost uncatchable, but you kind of thought, I'll go and have a go anyway. Uh there was a couple of lads from school who we used to fish with, Gaz and Tom. And we basically just decided to get, get the Stoke ticket and, and go on there. His dad, had, Tom's dad had done a bit on there. Uh, so we were just fishing it in the winter to start with. We were a bit intimidated by the other <laughs> fellas on there, the, the decent oh, yeah. carp anglers. You know, we'd have odd, odd rod setups and anything we could cobble together. And uh, it just progressed from there, really. The fishing on there, talk to me about the main lake. The stock pond, obviously, you've pretty much detailed in terms of there was plenty of carp. You were able to get some bites, fashion stuff up and cobbled together, and it was still relatively formative. That main lake, talk to me about size of its stock and your sort of experiences initially getting on there. Yeah, uh, I mean, we soon progressed into proper carp anglers Mm. within months of being on there, I suppose. It's... It's about six acres, the main lake, big long estate lake, uh, waterfall at one end, good turnover of water, run straight through it, lily pads, bridge over the middle of it. There's not many lakes where you can walk into the middle of the lake and and view what's passing up and down down the place. Uh, Relatively shallow, like a lot of estate lakes, silted up over the years. it's probably four and a half, five foot at the deepest down near the dam end. I mean, it had a remarkable stock of 20s at the time. I mean, it wouldn't seem anything these days. It's probably 25, 20s. They're was, big fish, aren't they? Yeah. At that yeah. time in the area. Uh, uh, so many people would have had the first 20 from that lake. And it had Moby. Uh, the, up to 33 pounds was its biggest weight, uh, which was, again, a giant in the area. Uh, certainly for us, but I, I, we'd have been naive. We, we, we would have taken it all for granted. I would have thought, uh, to some extent. It's funny, isn't uh, it? Like the sort of turn of circumstance, which obviously led to what we're going to come to in terms of chapters. But it's local to you, or local to to where we are now. The stock of carp for the area at the time, as you say, are unbelievable. And no doubt that being there, the location, the proximity to it, you being on there at that time and learning, 
led you to what is an incredible journey. Not that I'm going to end the journey because you're going to get back to fishing. I know you are, but it, it's mad to think that if you maybe grew up somewhere else with different influences and, and a different experience, you could have been anything else. Or you might not have even fished. Yeah, yeah, I could say that for anything though, couldn't you? Really? Crazy though, isn't it? It's a, it is, it is, it is strange how your life takes different directions, isn't it? Just by odd, the odd decision. The fishing on there, mate, how, initially you're going to find that very difficult. Yeah, it's I mean, it's always been a very tricky, like, with all with all uh, day ticket waters and small waters in general, uh, I think anyone will agree that they, they do tend to be very tricky fish to catch uh, just by the nature of the scenario. Uh, they're pressured all the time and being day only. They can make that choice to just get conditioned into feeding at night. <laughs> they know if they can s- stay off that bait for the day, then they can do what they want with it at night. Tackle bait rigs. Where were we at this time on that lake? Uh, I would say it was the the rigs people were using were cutting edge at the time. You know, they were experimental. Uh, the likes of Frank were fishing over there. Every now and again, you get some of the Reeds Mill lads coming over. So you, you had lads that were top of the game, and uh, all the all the modern all the modern rigs were being used at the time on there. Uh, I don't imagine they've changed too much, really, either. What were you using? Can you remember? It's a while ago. I'm asking you. Yeah, it was a lot. Of, uh, everybody was using the, the Christon products at the time. Yeah. Uh, so all their braids, all, you, all putting the little bits of tungsten putty on them to weight it all down, the paranoia of uh, the rig being stood up. Uh, I was using B175s a lot on the... Oh, well, yeah. They, they were the hooker choice. The old fly hooks, The old mate. fly hooks, yeah. You were sharpening them up. We used to yeah. sharpen them at that point? Yeah, yeah, you were, you were sharpening back then. If anything, it was more relevant then. Yeah, you needed it. And the hooks were softer, so they were a lot easier to sharpen up. Uh what, and we, what, what were you sharpening them up with? You just got a normal sort of file or something? And just yeah, no, on. no. We it, it used to uh, fly angles always sharpened hooks. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So you get nice little uh, hook sharpness from the fly sections and the tackle shops. Yeah, man. I remember. It, I think Shelley writing about the old B one seven fives and me using them when I was yeah in my formative years. But as you say, they were quite soft, weren't they? They were a soft hook. Yeah, and. Uh, I learned that lesson once I took them on the weedy waters like Reedsmere in the top pool <laughs> quite quickly. Uh, but it was strange because we were snag fishing at the time as well, sort of hook and hold stuff. We were never opening them up. No way. Yeah, yeah. Braided hook length, yeah? Yeah, braided hook Christ lengths, products, yeah, 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 like silkworm. Uh, we were using multi-strand rigs at times as well. Uh It's a good pattern though, isn't it? That sort of longer shank, in-turned eye, like they were, I mean, we see it now. We've got like twister long shanks that are pretty similar and twisters that are pretty similar in terms of the the sort of composition of the hook. They're aggressive. They do hook them, don't they? Yeah, yeah. We 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 had great success with the anchor rig as well. It's another rig that Frank devised, I think. Uh, just a, a short piece of uh, stiff mono uh, across the across the shank, and it just turned the hook beautifully. How do you? How do you? You just well, you were using shrink tube. Yeah. So you'd use a baiting needle, put a hole through it, and then thread this uh, little short piece of uh, stiff mono. It's about sixty pound we were using. Right. Uh, through the shrink tube, shrink it, and it'd be nice and tight onto the hook. Give like a little anchor formation on it. It uh, really turned the hook well. How long was that piece of mono? Uh, Five minute? mil. Right. Okay. Real. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was at the eye, yeah? Just Pretty below much. the eye. Yeah. I've yeah. seen it. I've never, I can't say I used it, but yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Stuff. Yeah, yeah the mad stuff. It's that, mad, yeah. <laughs> used, but yeah, it, it worked really well. Captures on the main lake? What stands out? What's your first fish? It's got to be a, a standout on there. Were your first uh, 20? Yeah, my me, me, me <laughs> first fish was uh, stalked on crust out of the pads. Uh, and that was sort of a seminal moment. That was me hooked then. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a mid-double. And then my second fish out was my first 20, which was £26. So that, a good I think, 20, uh, mate. Yeah, I think my PB was £15 then. So it completely obliterated it. 
It turned out to be two ton, the biggest fish in the lake in future years. What? Yeah, How'd so, you catch that off the deck? Yeah, that was, uh, I think it was on the dam wall that day, and the sun had come out, it warmed up, cloud had dispersed, so I went for a wander. I just found some fish mooching in, right tight in, in one corner, and there were some rhododendrons uh, clouding up a little bit. So I went and got my kit, lowered a rod in, sat back, and uh, within about half an hour it was away. I don't think there was anyone on my side of the bridge either. Uh, two Manchester lads, uh, Robbie and Tony, were on the other side. They come over and did the pictures for me. It's, it's, it's one of the biggest regrets of uh, of my fishing on there. I never used to take take a camera much with me, mm. so I got them to take the picture, and it didn't come out. I ended up there was another guy that worked for a, a Kodak at the time. He says, "Get me the negatives." And I might be able to do something with them. I got the negatives off them. You could see, it, you know, you could see the fish and me on it. But for some reason, he couldn't sort it. I never got a picture. I did catch it again, but it would have been nice to have had that. No pics. Well, yeah. it was I've, got, I've, I've got tons of missing pictures of fish. It's, it's my one regret. I mean, through my fishing, it never bothered me at all. But nowadays, the old nostalgic look back... Can't do it. I've seen a few throwback mega pictures you've put on the old Instagram, mate. I've got I've got plenty of old ones, but well, you've uh, caught plenty, mate. Uh, yeah, uh, some of them. Are, it's, it's problem. Yeah, some of them I miss. Mate, this is hindsight's a beautiful thing, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, I wish you'd taken more pictures of the lakes as well. I never used to do that, I'm so I've got guilty of that, yeah. very few. But it was all it was all print back then, wasn't it? So you didn't want to waste. You did have a camera. You didn't want to waste those twenty-four pictures taking rod shots. The amount of <laughs> pictures I've taken that, when come to develop, have been absolutely pants, like yeah. completely out of focus. Just so, some of them you get, you, you get the, you rush down boots to get them developed. You get the pack back, and the, every one of them would be jet black. Yeah, There'd be oh, nothing yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. But I just gutters. paid eight quid for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute gutters, mate. Uh, you, your sort of progression on that main lake. How how long do you spend on there? How how sort of I don't know how not easy, but how sort of predictable did that become in terms of being able to catch when you went uh, down there? It was it was very. I want to say Peggy. Uh, there was there was a certain amount of swims you you could guarantee you'd be in with a good chance. Mm. You used to queue up every morning, uh, first light, and if you you'd get there an hour or two before they were allowed to go in, and people had made their minds up what swims they they wanted, depending on where they got in the queue. So some of the better swims would go quite quickly. Uh, so you could you could you could kind of get in these swims and feel like you had a good chance if you got there early on. Why were uh, they better think, swims? I, I think it, it tended to be the snaggier swims and where there was sanctuary. Mm. So when it got busy, it, it probably pushed fish into those areas. Uh, and through the summer as well, things like the bridge with the pads, fish would gravitate towards them to sun themselves in the day. Or, like I say, the pressure would push fish into the snags. Because the estate got busy with people visiting as well, so you'd get uh, tourists of a word trudging up and down the gravel all day uh, and it could get you could get quite quite chaotic around there at times uh, so those swims were a little bit better but even if you got in them by dinner time you'd be going for a wander around the lake and you might find something but with us with with it being such a small lake fish were just doing laps of it all the time anyway so it wasn't, you know, you you could see the same group of fish come past ten times in a day. <laughs> Moby, did you ever get him? No, never got Moby. Oh, uh, that, that's got another, away. yeah, that's another big regret that I didn't stay on a bit longer for Moby. So I did, I did three seasons, full seasons on there, and then went on to Reed's me. Uh, so was it was it pretty much after that three seasons <clears> you were ready for that move on to Reed's me, and you'd done what you needed to do in terms of preparing yourself ability wise, just generally fishing and, and having a bit of experience to go or not. Yeah. I would certainly progressed as an angler in those three years. I mean, you learn fast as a kid, don't you? Uh, especially chucked in at the deep end on somewhere like uh, Cape Thorn. 
<clears throat> and and the lure of Reedsmere was probably too much in the end, even though that was quite an intimidating move. Uh, I think Cape Thorn had been... It had had a leak on the dam towards the end of the third season. Was it the third season? The second season, 96, in the autumn. Uh, so they, they had to drain the lake down, and they moved them all into the top pool, uh, which is, you, you've walked around yeah, Cape yeah, Thorn, yeah. haven't you? You've seen the top pool. Yeah. Lovely, lovely little Monet painting type. Beautiful. Yeah, boathouse, lily pads, gorgeous lake. Uh, I'm just digressing a bit there. We, we'd we walked around Top Pool a bit, me and my mate Gaz, in the summer of that second season. And it used to be a syndicate uh, years prior and had had a fish kill. Mm. So there was hardly any carp left in it. And we had a wander around and we saw... I think we saw about a dozen fish, mainly sort of mid-double commons, and then a low 20, and one that we might have thought was 30, was getting on for 30. So a big, a big fish that nobody was fishing for. There was nobody on there apart from tench anglers. And we thought, well, we'll have a go at that next year. Mm. Uh, and then the the lake got drained and all the fish got moved into there. So nobody knew what was what. You know, they'd all, It was all a mixed bag then. Uh, and they, I think this, I think they got them out the following spring once they'd fixed the dam and refilled the main lake. But they left about thirty odd in there. So we said, oh, "Sod it, we'll go on there because we'll go on there at the beginning of the season." You've got to remember it was traditional close season at most places back then. So we went on the sixteenth of June and uh, fished that for. For a couple of months, we, we caught straight away. It was uh, it was nice fishing. We had the place to ourselves. Uh, ne- didn't really know what was in it as far as what was left from the main lake. Uh, That's quite exciting, though, isn't it? Yeah, it, it was nice. It was nice, and it was really, really weedy, gin clear, good visual fishing. Which it, the main lake wasn't that clear. Yeah, so you didn't get that, uh, and that's where that's where I developed the love for. For watching, uh, watching what was going on, get getting the rods out and getting up a tree, uh, and just watching how the fish react to to your spots. Was that the Which, early love for climbing as well, there, mate? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> just up and down the trees all day long. What sort of stuff did you say that that sort of really resonated? Because I remember that's that's probably it's quite a fortunate sort of period if if you can actually observe your quarry like that with rigs mm. rather than just seeing them behave naturally feeding on spots, but. The ability to be able to see that is something that massively sort of opens your eyes as a, as a carp angler, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You, you certainly, you quickly realise how many times you're getting done. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, yeah. It was, uh, but sometimes there was no rhyme or reason to it. You could watch a group come in, want to drop down, pick your rig up, and then carry on as if nothing had happened. You'd see the lead come up off the bottom, little puff of silt, and then next minute, the, you're expecting the rod to be going, but the fish are just ambling off, and the rig's still where, it, virtually where it was. Uh, and you'd sort of, and then you'd see another group come past, and next one I pick it up, and bang, it was hooked. Mm. Uh, and sometimes you'd they'd be doing it all day. You'd be changing rigs, trying, trying your best to sort it out. Uh, and it, and it, it, you would sort it, but phew, it's just one of them things, really. It's, it's fascinating. Any weird behaviour that you saw or anything that was sort of any particular? Because what I've found, I don't know, again, you, you'll enlighten me better because you probably had more hours watching fish, but they're quite individual, mate, aren't they? Yeah, definitely, yeah. You, certain ones you know, that'd be ahead of the pack, you, mm. you could tell in their body language that they were, got, they were going to be the ones that had dropped down. Uh, as you say, bigger fish. You do see that the bigger fish in the lake are the the bullies almost. They they will dictate uh, who eats first. Usually, mm. then. <laughs> see any any fish sort of I don't know like pushing others off the spot or any other fish alerting other fish or anything like that. Uh, yeah, you 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 would see. The, certainly, the body language of. If if one noticed, mm. the others would know straight away, you know. The fins would prick up, 
and he'd take the rest with him. Uh, that had happened a lot. But places like Topool, they were just they were they were always travelling. You weren't you weren't often finding them grubbing. It would just be you'd be fishing a spot, and they'd be doing circuits, and you'd be hoping they'd drop down. And now and they would often drop down, but they'd be up and moving again. They wouldn't hang about and and eat loads. Uh, but it was interesting. It, well, it was interesting. Bait was at the time. Had, had this been a point at which you'd sort of sparked a fascination with bait or not? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd been had been using. Obviously, you you rolling all your own bait back then, mm. uh, buying base mixes uh, and rolling it from stuff you bought from the shop. And I, I think ninety six, ninety six or ninety five, I'd bought. I'd bought Rob Malin's book off uh, off a friend, Tiger Bay. Yeah, and that that that, that changed everything for me. Reading his uh, bird bird food sections, uh, and I'd been buying bird foods and rolling them up, and I realised I could make them much cheaper than myself. Mm. Uh, so I, I used a few of Rob's recipes, uh, rolled some of them up, and it was. You know, it was, it was just it was just fun making your own bait and uh, catching on it. I think we, the first one we made that was actually ours, me and my mate Gaz, I think it was canary seed, red factor. Uh, we'd found this puppy rearing milk, lactob, really creamy, nice uh, milk protein. Yeah. And just buy it from the pet shop. So we're mixing that up with uh, chalky malt and... Minamino, I think, and uh, we went down in the closed season. This was before Top Pool opened. Chucked about two pound of it, and just watched these fish come in, make a beeline for it. We're up the tree, dropped down, ate it all. Ah, oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> We're away here. Yeah, boys. Yeah, and it cost us about quid fifty a kilo at the time, so wow. I couldn't fault that. And and that that's where it began. That's where it began making my own bait. Yeah. It's that an additional buzz, I suppose, isn't it? It's probably something that we miss out on a lot. Now. I mean, I roll your own, maybe your own cork ball hook baits or something that you do quite bespoke, but it's definitely an aspect of cot fishing that's gone for the masses. It's there on the shelves now. Yeah. But it's an, it must be an yeah. additional buzz, like you say, if you're making a complete mix yourself and then seeing fish, well, catching on it, but also seeing the reaction that fish have. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is it is another part of it, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very satisfying. Uh, to make your own kit and uh, and, and catch fish on it, yeah. Mm. Take me to Reeds, man, mate. That well, I think, as a venue, is Northwest history stuff from the get go. When you got on there, what was the the makeup of the lake in terms of of carp stock, and also who was fishing it? Because there, there's a a lot of the who's who of the carp scene from up here that have that have passed through that over the years. Yeah, all of them really, I suppose. Uh, virtually all of them have, have been there. Uh, so after Cape Storm, after the, uh, being on the estate, I'd met a few of the lads that fished over there. So I kind of knew a, a, a bit of the click on there because okay. it has always had that reputation of being a bit clicky, like a lot of big fish waters back then. Uh, so I decided, me and a mate decided, go and have a go in the winter prior to fishing, to moving on to it. And uh, it became the realisation that I thought, oh, sod it, I'm going to go on reeds, mate. I'm going to try that. Uh, I don't care uh, if I blank all season. It's just nice to go on there and perhaps catch one. Uh, so when on the first season, what would that have been? 1998, Okay, I think this was. Uh, and... I mean, it was it was, it was uh, opening year was sixteenth of June again. I'm sure it was. Uh, sure that was. Uh, as it did uh, it did go back to the beginning of June at one point, uh, but I think it was sixteenth, or at least for people that hadn't done the work parties, and it was still busy then. Uh, as you say, the who's who. Frank had been on there, still doing a bit on there. I'm not sure whether Gaz had started on there by then. 
he may have turned up middle of that summer. This is Gaz Fairham, yeah? Gaz Fairham, yeah. Ali wasn't on the scene yet, I don't think. Uh, but people like Scott Day, mm. uh, <clears throat> I think Blackpool Pete, Pete, uh, there was loads of them. Everyone there was a bit of a name you'd seen in the mags and you'd seen uh, in the mainline adverts. Uh, How do you feel about that coming on? As you said, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it. But yeah, it's still quite intimidating because I'm I'm only sixteen at this point, That's uh, and uh, you've got all these fellas that have caught loads of big fish from the area, uh, casting miles out. You know, we, we, yeah. I come from a lake where I was fishing. <laughs> Two and three quart test curve northwesterns were bait runners uh, fishing at that's thirty yard at max max yeah. and these guys are fishing at one twenty one thirty spotting at those ranges and uh, yeah it was a, it was a step up to say the least it was a bit futuristic I suppose what was the stock mate at the time when you got on that first season uh, I <clears throat> think I think everyone estimated about eighty carp. Some might argue 100, but it was probably under 100 uh, going on. Past experiences of, of being on lakes and you kind of, you can kind of see what, what the top rods are getting. Mm. They're usually the same on all lakes with, with a certain amount of stock in, aren't they? You can uh, draw an average from that. Uh, so it was probably right, give or take 10 or 20 fish, maybe. Size-wise? Uh, 40 acres. Yeah. Reads me. Is it 48? Because I didn't... Yeah. It doesn't look that big. doesn't look it. No. no. It's supposed to be, but... Right. Yeah. And fish fish sort of... Well, you had a, obviously 20 pounders. What was the top end of, of things at that time? Uh, the male. The male common was the biggest in it at the time. Uh, up to 38. Was it up to 30? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was the biggest common in the region. Uh, by some, I think. Mm. Yeah. Your experiences fishing, was it flinging fluoros into the middle like Frank and, and doing it that way? Or did no, you... not for me, no. Uh, I, obviously, I did do it at certain certain times. Certain times of the year, it was effective in the autumn, single up bait fishing to mm. show in fish. Uh, but my approach tended to be, the majority of the fish I caught was sort of under 60 yard, stringers, catapult range, you know, bit of bait over it, uh, a lot of fish on stringers. Stringers, fishing on the deck. Fishing on the deck, yeah. Bottom no baits. Pop-ups. No, no. Never been a never been been, been a big fan of pop ups. Why? But in a single hook bait scenario, yeah. Why not uh, over some boiling? No. Eh? Putting in bottom baits. Why not put bottom baits mm, with them? You're one of them, ain't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that is one thing I have seen from from watching fish. They they can well, it sticks out amongst the rest, doesn't it? So they know which. They can certainly spot the danger quite quickly if they're that way inclined. Yeah, 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 definitely. I've been definitely. cleaned out plenty of times on pop ups. Have you? Yeah, yeah. Stone Acres was bad for that. You want to get? The old I'd Ronnie always have Rick. a pop up rod out somewhere. Would you? And the other two would be uh, on the deck, and fucking hell, the amount of times <laughs> so I'd go out there and the, there was just a pop ups out there. Brutal. I think a lot of the times, whenever I did catch on pop up, it was because they'd just come in and seen a single hook bait there and grabbed it. But, uh, I know that I know it makes the hooking arrangement a little bit better. But also, you've got I used to I used to use eighteen mil bottom baits a lot, so you've got that weight there, and uh, it, it certainly seemed to trip them up at times, most mm. of the time. Reads me quite silty. Very silty, yeah. As the whole sort of Cape's form experience before us. Yeah. For you at that time, fishing in and around those sort of silty lakes, what 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 adaptations or what did you do to combat that? Because for somebody who, and a lot of people in the Northwest are used to it because it is part of the course, a lot of people down south are fishing gravel pits and looking for gravel spots amongst weed. It's a different sort of makeup generally in those lakes. What Did you do anything specific lead system wise or anything to accommodate that? Or was it just a, a case of being able to just confidently put it out there and not necessarily get any form of drop and, and catch them on it? Well, one problem with Cape Storm was that uh, they had a weight limit of one and a half ounce, which was, you'd get takes that just start and stop quite regular. Mm. I'm sure that was down to the, 
that not you know the weight not setting the hook. Uh, I can't remember why they came up with that rule. I think it was something to do with casting at the bridge because you'd have public on the bridge. Didn't want you cracking off in that direction, <laughs> killing someone. <laughs> I can't imagine a one and a half ounce lead that uh, no, you just feel, feel too good if that hit you either. But uh, yeah, anyway, it was one and a half ounce. Uh, so that rule in itself was probably helping you combat the silt a bit. Uh, because for for people that fish down south and haven't really fished silty waters, it's hard to convey how deep the silt is on these waters. You know, you, you could go out in a in the punt and stick an oar down. You could see the bottom two feet down. Mm. You stick a six foot foot oar straight down into it, to, right up to the, to your wrist before you felt hard bottom. Uh, You'd have like a soupy top layer, uh, mm, gloop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it, it literally just like suspended detritus uh, in places. Uh, so there's only so much you can do with that. You've just got to got to fish into it, and they're feeding in it, and uh, hope for the best. Uh, I know on the top pool where it's really bad. Uh, I used to free line on there. I'd sort of put a little bag, mesh bag of, of bait on to get out there uh, and free line, free line out onto that. And that, that seemed to work quite well. Rather than use a lead? Yeah, no lead. No lead. He's gone proper old school there, haven't you, mate? Yeah. And, and, and that was in <coughs> winter as well. That was fairly successful tactic in winter. Oddly enough, single tiger nut was, was the one in winter up there. A single tiger nut in winter? You'd find them up the shallows in sort of one and a half foot of water. Uh, If you didn't get up the tree, you wouldn't see them. They weren't even breaking the surface. And they were dropping down into this deep silt, having a feed, in the evening usually. Uh, So you just sling out a single tiger. Uh, Sometimes use little quarter-ounce bombs. Yeah. uh, And just long links. And we're catching them on... no one else was up there at the time, but we were just catching them on single tiger nuts. You wouldn't nuts. think that, would you? You wouldn't think a single tiger nut would uh, get their attention at all. It's interesting as also as well, like when you come on to read to me and you're fishing, this, were, you, were you at a point there where you were able to distinguish sort of firmer, siltier drops and stuff within read to me where they may have fed, or was it pretty uniform? Yeah, it was pretty uniform. You never felt for drops on her. No. That was something that... Uh, Developed from fishing down the pits, I suppose, but it was uh, nobody ever felt the lead down. <laughs> Whack it down, yeah, boy. Yeah, just be like, yeah, that'll do. And Good stringers spot. as well, you said. Stringers and yeah, okay. uh, bags down the shallows. Uh, this is before you could you could get decent PVA bags, so we used to buy the sheeting. Uh, it'd sort of come, like, I guess it but like five foot by five foot. <laughs> PVA sheeting. And you'd see in the close season again when you're prepping everything, you'd be cutting your, your bags, making them, gluing them all together with your mouth. Jeez. And then uh, I had a little uh, like binder. I'd put all my different size PVA bags in. I've never that heard of the sheeting, mate. Yeah, sheet, I've never yeah. heard of that. Yeah. That's proper <laughs> a piece of sheeting. I'm you're there with your bags. scissors, cutting these square, square bags. Uh, ready. <laughs> Bit easier ready now, for mate. The, yeah, ready for the beginning of the season. Captures fishing, sort of memorable moments on there, mate. Talk to me about about that. We've sort of had an overall gloss of the venue itself, but obviously there were you did equate for quite a lot of the fish on there. Talk to me about that. Uh, well, I went on there. Obviously, I'd never had a thirty. Uh, first season, I think I caught my second trip. Uh, Again, it was in June, beginning of the season. So buzzing with that, that was it then. I was hooked. Uh, I think that was 19. And then I probably, I probably didn't catch again till end of July. Uh, I think I lost a couple. Lost a couple in June fishing off the lead pop-ups out in the... Uh, I can't remember what type of weed it was. It was like a a grass. I've not seen it on many places since, but it just looked like snake bite. 
uh, which had just come out. So ideally, we'd just stick a pop up on our, on two and a half foot off the lead pop up, chuck that out into the uh, into this grass. And you just get takes on that. That was uh, that was a good tactic. Uh, so towards the end of July, I'm sure it was the end of July when I when I had the original Lynn. I was down the shallows one time. A bit of daylight today, cloudy, wet, mm. uh, just mixed weather. It wasn't the kind of weather people would go looking down the shallows. Usually people go looking in uh, blazing sunshine. Uh, and there wasn't many fish down there at the time. There was probably about 10 or 15 knocking about, but I had it to myself. And I think I had, I had a 20-odd 20, 20 common uh, and then a 20 mirror. I know, and I was buzzing with that, you know. If, uh, That's quality, yeah. Br- first brace out of there. I'd done my 48. It was 48-hour sessions. So you were allowed in one swim at a time then. So I went home. I got home and I sat on the sea thinking, why have I just come home? I've got, I can do another night if I want it in another swim. So I thought, sod it, I'm going back. Got my parents to drop me back off. can't remember which one. <laughs> Uh, and then got the rods back out in in a similar area in the swim next door. And I just remember waking up in the morning to one of the rods. You had your rods quite high because of all this floating weed. Right. Uh, just one of the rods fucking down, flat down, screaming off. Uh, so I jumps out of bed, plays this fish in, gets it right in front of the, uh, the, the little uh, pontoon that you're fishing off. Looks down, I thought, oh my God, that's massive. And it's just sat there. I thought, I'd better net it. Uh, got it. Yeah, it was just literally sat there in front of a, in front of the weed. And uh, I slipped my net under it, looked in. It big diamond-shaped mirror. Really oh. wide fish it was. It was only short. Uh, and it was the original linear. Uh, one of the nicest fish in the lake. Uh, and that was my first 30 uh, Thirty pound twelve, so I was absolutely over the moon with that. So any, anything else was a bonus that year. Uh, and as it happened, um, I went on to catch Capey Linear that winter as well at thirty four. Uh, that's a mega fish. It's a mega looking fish, isn't it? <coughs> yeah, is cool, but yeah, that's a cool one. really scrapped as well. That thing, even in even in February. Uh, that that was another one. It was. It'd been a tough winter, a few of us on. I've got good mates with Gaz by then. I met him through the summer. And me and Gaz had done quite a bit through the winter. Uh, seen the odd fish here and there. Uh, saw fish off the stream one morning in January. Uh, and it hadn't, it hadn't done a fish since the October, I don't think. And there was quite a few of us carrying on through the winter on there. Winters were generally poor, though, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, was, yeah. it was a tough water in winter. I mean, this is a water still where nine or ten fish in a season's a, a bloody good year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it had been really weedy on the far, on, on the new bank all summer. I mean, you, now you look back and go, oh, of course, that's where they'll be mucking about in the winter. Uh, but I hooked a trailer off the stream... I think the week before, and that was quite quite far over towards the new bank. And I thought to myself, I, I, I've picked that up in new bank water, that trailer, so they're definitely knocking about over there. So I went over that next week. I thought I'm going to put a bit of bait in, see if uh, see if they're about. I think I put I put a couple of kilo of chops out, only about sixty yard, just where it starts dropping into deeper water. And the uh, middle of the night, off it went with a capey lin at uh, 34. So I was ecstatic with that. Winter captures, mate. They're always, they look mega, but they're always special. Yeah, they? They, they always feel really special, don't they? Ten times more, I reckon. Yeah. Especially that type of fish, mate. That's incredible. Yeah. It was, uh, the sea, obviously, it was location. Bait wise, you talked there about introducing some bait. Where are you on the bait front? Here? I was using mainline then. Were you? Yeah, I was on mainline then. It was it was a pretty mainline orientated yeah. water, uh, and the likes of Gary Mitchell, really good, really good angler. Uh, 
he was a mainline tester. And he'd had a word with Steve and obviously sorted out that sorted out some cheaper bait. So uh so I was on board with mainline then. And I was for a fair few years. It was you know, it's really, really good stuff. I, I used to grange a bit on Cape Stone. That was a mega bait that was. Mm. Uh at this point, you're not even you're not rolling around hook baits or anything. You yeah, just, yeah. I was doing are. I was doing my own hook baits. Yeah, even when when I was using the activate, it was uh, I was doing activate uh, corkers. Okay, but they were for, mainly for the off the lead pop ups. They were working really well because you'd, you'd roll them in the closed season. Yeah, and keep you had the mainline activator, so you'd add a bit, get them soaked in it, dry them out. Add a bit, and you just do that over a few weeks. Mm. So they were absolutely honking, <laughs> uh, and and the, yeah, they they were winners as well. Off the lead, mate. Geez. Off the lead, yes. Yeah. Z- or zigs. Go on the zigs. Z- yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. Fair play. Uh, Talk me through that. The rest of reads, man, for you, mate, with regards to sort of how things panned out. Because obviously, it's a water. You can spend an awful lot of time fishing there if you wanted to, especially in the area locally, because I don't... A a lot of people did. A lot of people were sort of lifers on there. You know, when I was on there, there's people that had been fishing it since the early 80s. Mm. Uh, There's there's two sets, really. There's people that fish the waters all their life and them that move on. Uh, I suppose people come back and dabble back on places. But, yeah, there was was a lot of lads that, that had been there years, and inevitably, they'd they'd had everything out of there virtually. But you don't know if you sit there forever, aren't you? <laughs> well, it <laughs> depends, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe not if you're well and lucky. But yeah, yeah if you've got yeah. time, it is a beautiful yeah. thing. But you just get to suss things out, don't you? You get so much so much uh, experience of a water. You see someone come and hammer it one year, and that's in the memory bank, isn't it? For you do, time. but there's people that don't. I know, I know, lads. And they know who they are. I've spent a lot of time on a venue. We still sort of don't compute that, maybe. Well, I, Do you think know that's, what I, mean? I think that's the biggest thing in fishing, isn't it? It's just you've got to take on all the information, whichever whichever way it comes from watching somebody else do it first. Mm. You'll, uh, or what somebody's seen something somewhere. You just remember it for the year after and things like that. I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, Gaz laughing at me once for... Uh, I caught a fish off the stream, and then he, he come around and said, he was fishing close in off the stream, which was a bit of a long-range area. He says, why did you fish there? He said, uh, I said, well, not last year, but the year before. Like, early October, I saw one come out on this spot. So <laughs> he's like, what? I said, yeah, but it's, you know, it's obviously somewhere they visit this time of year. And it can be as simple as that. I don't know if that's simple, mate. Last October, I can't remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> Last October, what showed on what lake? But yeah. I suppose that's the difference, and a lot of people have talked about this with regards to you in a way, that sort of computing of information, that building a picture, but also that that ability to then recall it and have that all to hand when they step onto a venue. Because it's not, I mean, it can be a complete... Did you keep a diary, a log or anything, or was it just all mentally uh, in there? All I ke- I used to keep a bit of a diary on Cape Uh but I think all I kept a diary of on reeds was uh, weights and captures. Mm. Uh, af- after that, it fizzled out, uh, and now I can't remember most of it. Well, mate, <laughs> there is documented evidence of it. You put a picture up the other day. Was it single that you had? Was it a picture of single? single yeah, yeah. That was when I went back in like 20, that was later. Yeah, twenty fourteen, yeah. something like that. <laughs> When the Reedsmere chapter, any other significant captures leading up until we, when you when you sort of left, obviously before you came back. Uh, the the year after, I had three of the three of the thirties out of there. I can't remember what they were now. I think long one. Uh, I think I had the Cape Thorn again and mid thirty. Uh, but yeah, I'm missing something. Ringtail, yeah, ringtail. Uh, You've caught them, boy, haven't you? So yeah, it was. It was because there was two big commons in there: the, the snub and the male. Mm. It tended to be all about the snub and the male, uh, so that's what you're thinking of. Uh, and it got to the point, 
Oh, yeah, I think it was the third season. I was thinking to myself, could really do with catching one of these. That would be nice because they were never targets when I went on. Uh, same with a lot of me fishing back then. I never really targeted anything. I'd just go on, and try my best to catch as many as I could. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, it got to a point where I was thinking, oh, I really want one of them big commons. And the more more I fish from, the further away I felt from them. Uh, I remember one occasion we were down down the shallows. It was me and the Another great angler, Nibby. Uh, he was really good in the edge angler, Nibby. Kind of did things his own way. If the swim come free that somebody had had five out of, he'd be like, I'm not moving in there. Mm. I don't want to catch him off the back of someone else's efforts. Uh, right, he'd just okay. bugger off and fish in the edge somewhere else. And uh, we'd gone for a walk and found him down in the shallows off this sandbank and it's it's the only it's the only occasion I've seen all the big fish in the lake in one area, and they were all there feeding up feeding in this sand dropping into the sand, uh, side by side. At one point, the male and the snub were there. And my my gear was just a little bit further up the bank, so I says oh, I'm going to try and stalk for these. So then Nibby says I'll go and get you some worms. So we went off into the into the woods digging for worms while I'm rigging a rod up. There was a set of low sedges in front of it, uh, in front of where they were. So we're on our bellies, creeping up <laughs> with this rod, uh, sort of free lining worms into the middle of some of the biggest, into, into the middle of some of the biggest fish, well, the biggest fish in the lake. And uh, I actually had a quill on. I had actually put my little, I was used to have a little porcupine quill. So I put that on. And it was just sat there in two and a half feet of water, Snubbing the male either side of it. Uh, and it's just bobbing away. You know, as they're just nudging it and nudging oh, the line. They can't resist a worm, uh, eh? Exactly. I was thinking that. I thought it was a done deal. I, you know, the amount of fish I'd caught on the on worm just free line in the past and on other lakes. And Nibby's looking at me, getting all excited. <laughs> I'm like, because sometimes the float would just slowly disappear under you know, but because they're, against they're the, big fish, so yeah. they're catching on the peck, or the, <clears throat> and then I'm like, "Fucking, I'll do a strike." He says, "You can't, Rob. You just gonna have to wait to see if the sails off." So uh, uh, to this, and it never happened. And to this day, I'll never know whether they had that hook bait in the mouth. Or they not. hadn't, mate. If they'd <laughs> yeah, have taken yeah, that, they'd you'd have think gone, so. Wouldn't yeah, you would think so. Uh, so that was quite. Uh, the last thing you want to do is strike at a quiver and then foul hook them. Exactly. It? Yeah, stick the hook in the belly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, oh, that's exciting, though, isn't it, mate? Well, they they moved out into an area called the Neck, where the it, it opens up into the main lake again. So I moved up there for the night and thought, oh, this is, I'll have them in the morning as they're coming back in. And then uh, I stayed there. Nibby come down. He said, "Do you mind if I move in where they were and see if they come back?" I said, "No, nah, mate, go for it." He went in there and had single scale. I was I was buzzing for him as well because <laughs> I netted it. Uh, and turned around and looked at him and said, single scale, mate. He says, you're joking, you're joking. And he just dropped his rod and started cartwheeling down the field, like literally <laughs> cartwheeling. And he, he had, like, hair down to here in Nibby. And uh, all you could see is this big, long hair flailing about as he's fucking this six-foot-odd fella's cartwheeling down there. He was, uh, he was made up with that. It was, it was good to see. Yeah, to, yeah, it was good to see. Uh <laughs> So yeah, that was uh, that was that occasion, uh, and then it got to the point where I think I was itching to move on. I seemed to get a three year itch where I've three seasons on the water, and I'm feeling like I'm ready to go. So regardless of not catching these commons, I was I was I was thinking of moving on, mm. and in this time, I'd already sort of lined tatting up. Uh, I'd. We'd been, we'd been and looked at it. It was around two thousand ninety nine, probably ninety nine. <clears throat> Me and I don't know, was, was Bry the Miner, uh, Mark the Bull, and Gary Mitchell of all people. So some of the most successful lads in the region and on Reedsmere at the time. We'd gone for a wander in the day to have a look at. Tatton, because we'd heard rumours of this netting on there by the EA. 
Uh, and we went up, we were watching them in the duck pond. We saw fish to, we reckoned, low 30. In the duck pond, yeah? In the duck pond, yeah. And none of them were that interested. We went back, there wasn't much talk of it. All I could think was a big lake here with carpet that nobody in the area is interested in. I thought, why are these lads not thinking of having a go? Mm. But I think they were just caught up in the reedsmere thing, you know. But also, like, <coughs> to be fair, the duck pond is tiny in comparison to the main lake, isn't it? So if you're seeing some 30s in the duck pond, you must be thinking, well, what else could be in that expanse? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's the, the other reason why they weren't that interested is, as you know, it, it, being a short section of fishing bank on that big lake, Yeah, you stand in the duck pond and look where the first swim is. And it's a dot in the distance, isn't <laughs> That's it? That's a long old way. <laughs> so you think to yourself, they spend most of the time in here, what bloody chance do we have? Of, uh, well, legitimately amongst, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was that then. I was for the relatively regular through the summer and the closed seasons on Reedsmere, I was cycling to the mere Reedsmere and having a look, watching them in the shallows and the close. And then I'd carry on to Nutsford and have a walk round the pond and round. What's the distance Tatton. between those two on a bike? Uh, it was a 38-mile round trip for, from my house. It's not exactly that close, is no, it? No, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's a f- an hour or so cycling, maybe two. And this this sort of venture to, to Tatton, obviously at the time you've seen a few on that first trip, the other lads are sort of more Reedsmere focused, but it's been a, a little trip over there. For you to then cycle that period of time to get there, to make the effort to walk around and sort of observe things and take things a little bit further, what... Why do you think that was? You'd had enough of Reeds, Mary? It was done for you? You needed a new challenge? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. I, th- I think I'd just got a bit stale on there and uh, just getting a bit fed up with the place, the same old, th- same old, same old. Yeah. Uh, I think once you catch a few out somewhere, then the buzz wears off a little bit. You, you just want that, that challenge of the unknown again. Not knowing if you're going to catch them or not. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are the same. You, you, you get onto a new water, and there's that new water buzz. So it's nice to to move on every now and again and get that. That first bite, innit? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that first challenge. That, uh, challenge of challenging yourself against, against a new lake, really, and everything that brings. At this point, you've talked about here the frequency that you fish Reedsmere, the travel up in the summer months to to Tatton to observe things and that process of moving on. What is life like outside of angling for you at this time? Because you're relatively young, Mm. but what what does that look like? What are you, are you working? Are you looking to go and do something career-wise or is it all, all fishing? Yeah, it's, uh, I was working at Chippy at the time. I remember being on fish at Reedsmere in the showers and jacking my job. That because I was meant to be in that evening. <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> you know what it's like. Oh, go on, boy. Yeah. What Did, was that call cool like? Well, it didn't go down too well. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get fish and chips like, to the bank? It wasn't like, I'm not in tonight. I'm not back in. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, it was... <laughs> It was a funny session, really. I'd, I'd, I'd come. It was towards the end of my session. I remember, obviously, I remember going home to go to work, and and they were all over me. It was, I'd run out of bait. I'd run out of everything. So I went over to Cape Sun in the evening because I knew lads would be leaving. I knew were over. I said, "Have you got any bait left?" Uh, <laughs> you know, just, I said. One of my mates says, oh, "I've got about a pound." I said, "I'll do nicely." You ain't got any PVA, have you? <laughs> yeah, so, so I got some, uh, I think I got some, it was the old Carperos cobweb. Yeah, yeah. Funnel web stuff. So I got some of that and uh, went back, chucked the rods out, put the bait in, hooked, hooked a beast the next morning, got it all the way in, could see it, big black mirror, 30 plus, wallowing on the edge of this weed. 
My mate goes down with the net, nets all the weed, lifts the arms, not in here. Not in here? <laughs> not in here, yeah, yeah, I couldn't believe it. It's like, what, I never felt, I never felt it come off. Just went into the weed under me, under me feet. Ditched the hook and left you with a massive ball yeah, of weed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jobless. <laughs> oh, God. He didn't see which fish it was? No, no. But it was a good one. Well, I, I saw the fish, but I couldn't tell which one it was. It was one of the good, one of the mirrors. Yeah. Oh, at least it wasn't a common though. Yeah, well, yeah. Take that. Yeah, yeah take and that. And at this point, when you, when you're sort of jacking in, jacking in the old chip shop, have you got any form of sort of thought of what you're going to well, move on I to or do? I done a, I done a course in horticulture in college, and uh, I think I thought I was going to get into that, and I never did. I started doing a bit for my dad in the, he worked in a nursing home. So I just started cooking in there. I was working with the, with the chef in there, feeding them all. And I <laughs> kind of, cause it was my dad's place, could pick and choose when I went, wanted yeah. to go in. Touch. So that, that helped. Uh, so that was sort of my money then. She didn't need much money back then as a teenager. Yeah, I was still going time. on the piss with the lads at weekends. Well, you so you didn't neglect all that then? Oh, no, no, no. I was just doing like three nights in the week and then binge drinking in the, in the weekend with the lads. And that went on for quite a few years. <laughs> Till about, what, 10, yeah, 10 yeah, years ago? Yeah, yeah yesterday. <laughs> no, no. Uh, talk to me about the time you left Reedsmere, the, the people you were on. You, you referenced Gaz there. Was Ali on at the time? When Ali he made was on, gone? yeah. We'd, we'd, uh, uh, Chris Wynn Stanley, who had met. Yeah. In the latter years of uh, Cape Stone, uh, become my, like my fishing partner, I suppose, uh, through the years, Chris. Uh, another lad, brilliant angler, caught tons of big fish, uh, just kept his head down and fucking caught them, you know. Uh, so Chris had come back onto Reed's Mead, he'd been on it in the past, in the early 90s. Uh, Ali turned up, it was... It was Sure, it was my first season. I met Ali, uh, became good mates with Ali, and there was a bit, there was a bit of a click of us uh, that were around that same age. Yeah, uh, in our teens, we'd go out on the piss. We'd stay at Ali's house, go into Manchester uh, at weekends. And we, it was a good crack. Oh, it sounds like good times there. Yeah. Scott. What was the old Hamidi like on a night out? Animal. He oh can yeah, talk, he's mate. not. He's not. Yeah. I, from what I can tell, he hasn't changed at all. No, nah, mate, he's a boy. I imagine he's brilliant on a night out. Yeah, oh, he's lively. <laughs> yeah, mate, it's what you want, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's happy times. So, go to Tatton, mate. Right, we're going to Tatton. You've started to walk it, you've said, regularly to have a little look and suss it out. What was the defining moment that you thought, right, I'm going to make the switch and, and start to sort of fish here and see what's about? Well, I saw one of the big commons. Uh, I'd, I'd been watching the mail that day down in the shallows on Reedsmere. It had been mid-May, something like that. Reedsmere was closed at the time. I had carried on to Tatton, uh, wandering around the duck pond, uh, came down, came round to near the channel, mm. and I could see a group of fish sat there. I saw one of the commons, uh, and I put it at about the same sort of size as the male at the time, which was... You know, the male was the Cheshire record a couple of years before. It's a thirty-eight poundish. Thirty-eight, 30, yeah. yeah, and it was still, it was still the region's biggest common. So to have one the same size sat there, that no one's fishing for. It was just mind there blowing. There was no anglers on there at the time. No, no, there was no, there was no one. Just tench anglers, the odd bream angler. Uh, Why do you think? Do you think you were the, some of the first people then to stumble across that? Yeah, we must have been. There's we no don't... way people could have known those fish were in there and not fish for them. I just don't... Uh, I yeah, it's they, too... They, I mean, there was lads local to it, but you wouldn't see other people around the duck pond uh, during those during those times. A year mm. or so later, you would. Uh, we went... So we were in, in the... That's got a traditional closed season on it. Yeah. That and us. Yeah. Uh, and me and Chris decided to go on. We said, we'll go on to Boothsmere, which is in Nutsford, do the close season, and then go on to... Uh, Tatton. On to Tatton. And uh, we'll start bait, we'll, we'll keep bait going in 
to happen through the closed season, start on 16th. Uh, so we fish booths and then we'd nip over onto Tatton after that for a little look all the time through April and May. And then this would have been 18 months after, maybe 18 months, two years after we'd first seen this uh, upper 30 common. That was the point where I was thinking, I'm going to have to fish this place at some point. Mm. And it was, it was a drizzly day in mid-May. We walked up to the Doug Pond and they're in the channel. We can see Fisher in the channel. We get to the edge of the channel. And I'm sure the first two fish we saw were the two biggest fish in the lake. And at the time, um, they'd done some bloody growing. One of them we put at low 40 cool. and the other we put at mid 40, which was, you know, Ridiculous. Cheshire records yeah. in front of us. <clears throat> so we knew we were on to something there that, uh, we, we knew we were going on anyway. Um, and then just paranoia kicks in of, good God, we don't want anyone to see these. Mm. Or uh, the whole north, the whole of Cheshire will descend on the place. Uh, so through the whole time we were on there, we kept thinking, people will see them yeah, it's and, and turn up. Yeah, yeah. And it, it never did. They never did. They, the masses, masses never uh, arrived. Why do you think that is? You guys kept it so tight? Well, we we kind of dropped off the scene when we were on there. Yeah. Uh, stopped talking to people. Uh, you know, people say, are you fishing? Say, I've not really had time lately. I've not, I've not been getting out. Obviously, a lot of them didn't believe us because they knew what we were like, uh, how keen we were. Uh, but, yeah, from... The, just they just never seemed to materialise on the, uh, but we were always paranoid of it. I bet. Yeah. That, I mean, that is as you say, like it's hard to put that into a modern day context. But that is essentially <coughs> like going down to your local park and seeing a British record swimming in it that yeah. nobody is fishing for, that yeah. nobody knows about, that you've got potentially to yourself, but that could quite easily be seen in that duck pond because if you go up there and look. That is naturally the first place you're going to look, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you can pull the car up next to it. Yeah. Uh, but we never, you know, you wouldn't see them in there every time you went in. It's no. You might see carp uh, fairly regular through summer. But to be fairly fortunate and see uh, those big two, especially those big two together, I don't think we saw them many times after that in that duck pond. It's the beginning of the season. Uh, went on 16th of June we've been probably baiting it for I don't know a month not mad just in as you probably know it's day only 7 7 in the morning till 7 at night mm. uh, where did you bait? well there's 50 pegs on it yeah. even though it doesn't look like there's 50 because it's quite a big lake uh, basically peg 50 Closest one to the duck pond, mm. which is still 500 yard maybe from the duck pond, something like that. And also, like, range-wise, <laughs> how far is it across? You ain't getting to the other side, are no, you? No, 350. Yeah, it's long. Something like that. It's yeah, long. It's a wide lake. Uh, set in a big deer park, country estate. Lo- lovely place, you know, fairly public. Uh, dogs jumping in all the time. Very uh, public. Yeah, very public, yeah. But because it's in Nutsford, it's it's a better class of public. <laughs> <laughs> it's it not, is, yeah, it's yeah. It's not like you're in... Cheshire Housewives country, Yeah, isn't it? yeah, you could be in worse worse places. Jaeger pants and horse riding. Yeah, it exactly, is. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you had that in your favour, I guess. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, you're blanking, yeah. Happy yeah. days, mate. What was the... um? When you were out there, when you were introducing bait, you obviously said as close as you can to the duck pond, but it's still miles away. Any sort of range, or are you just spreading it wherever? No, we uh, we'd had a we'd had a little flick about with the marker float, and uh, it's it's quite a deep lake down the middle. Uh, it's you know it goes down about thirty five foot something like that, uh, and in front of peg fifty, it would it sort of went off gently, uh, and we could get twelve foot on the other side of the weed. Mm. So that was was, was an, it was fifty yard as well, yeah, and yeah, comfortable. Yeah, and we could get in in chesties, 
take 10 or 15 yard off our chesties so we could bait up with the catapult. So it was ideal. I make things We'd just rock up with a catty and a bucket. And uh, we, were, we were putting in halibut pellet at the time because we, could, we, could, we were getting it fairly cheap when halibut pellet was cheap. Uh, sort of 18, 20 mil halibut pellets. So it was a good bulk feed. Mm. We were getting that in, we are boily. Uh, we chucked a few at them in the duck pond. And they'd eaten them straight away. What, halibut pellets? Yeah, halibut pellets and boilies. So that was encouraging because you always have that in your mind with uncaught carp that they're not really going to know what bait is. 100%. But they tested it. They were straight on it and snaffled it up like koi's in a koi pond. Biggins? Did you have either the two commons? Have them? Yeah, straight away. Yeah, oh, my yeah. God. We're, uh, chucking them at them as well. Did you not think just to maybe have a cheeky bit in of bread on them on their heads and just get it done? The, the problem we had with it was... Obviously, that's the temptation, but you, you're out in the open there. The rangers are always flying about in the in their uh, oh, yeah. little Land Rovers. And uh, we didn't really know how hard it would. We knew it would be a difficult lake, but for all we knew, it could have been quite easy. It could have caught mm. them quite quickly, okay. seeing how... Seeing how they'll drop, they dropped down on bait and just ate it straight away. There was no point jeopardising it by waving a rod and the landing net round it, round yeah. the duck pond, and then getting live bands from the place. Okay. So <clears throat> we decided to do the days and do a couple of seasons and take it from there. Maybe uh, get a bit more extreme if needs needs be. Uh, but as it happened, first day of the season. Chris caught two tone out of there. We'd only been on two hours. It tore off. Uh, he caught two tone at. It was a mid twenty then, but it was a fish we used to see in 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 the lake with the others. So we thought if we can catch one, oh mate, we this can is catch easy. the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, catching it on the first day, we thought that's actually quite easy on here, isn't it? Uh, I think I caught the next one. August. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking out, and right. Then, uh, and then Chris didn't catch again that season. Reality that, set in, yeah. I caught two tone in the September, and that was the first season. Uh, two for me, one for him. But Two tone the same. Two tone <laughs> twice, friendly. yeah. Yeah, it was always friendly, that fish. I think Chris caught it three times. Uh, and that was... That first year, I probably fished it the most. I was fishing it at least three days a week, cycling there too. I well, still wasn't driving at this point. I was mucking about, cycling. Oh, mate. Some, some odd reason. Some, like, I don't know, some obsession to drive yourself to do that, isn't there? Yeah. It was, <laughs> I suppose it, it was the focus of them things. You know, you knew there was something special there to be had. So that... Made you get your head down on the bike when it was pissing down on the way there and stuff. How just, do you organize just think your, of them commons. How do you organise your gear with all that? Uh, you had to cut it back quite a bit. I mean, you, I, I travel light at the best of times, but <clears throat> it was just rucksack, rods, unhooking mat. And that's that, really. I'd just sit on my unhooking mat. No kettle. I suppose it's days only, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, days only. Yeah, I'd, I'd, well, Chris was driving, so he'd always turn up there. He came from Northwich. So we'd have the brew kit. Yeah. I was going to say that's an absolute essential. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he'd do the he'd do the duties with the brew kit. Yeah. So that first sort of season, literally free bites, mate. Yeah. Fishing wise, obviously <clears throat> you, you're putting the bait in. You've targeted that area. You're still putting bait in. Rigs that you went in with, sort of your standard bottom bait. Yeah. Approach. Well. Uh, it, <laughs> We were getting a little bit of trouble of hybrids as full of it was full of roach bream hybrids to, went to about seven pound. They were quite big. Seven a pound. Yeah, yeah they were. Uh, never knew what the record was for them, but you probably it had wouldn't it. surprise me if it was in that place. There was there was a lot of loads of them, and uh, they were hassle. I suppose chucking halibut in didn't really help, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I decided to go with really big up baits. So I made 40s. I thought 40 millers. 40 millers, yeah. 
to just eliminate them. <clears throat> I thought to myself, because I mean, I'd seen the gobs on these things. They were enormous. And I thought, they look pretty greedy. So surely a massive upbait, some big naive uncooked carp would just be out. That, that's what I'm having. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was using 40s uh, and I was, I was into super specialists at the time. I was using them a lot. Right, and they're a, they're a small they're a Tiny small gauge they're a small gauge hook even in a even in a six. So I just used fairly long hairs, so the bait wasn't rolled onto the hook. So you know, inch inch or so hairs, so the hook wasn't sat up off the off the, off yeah, the bottom. The deck, yeah. yeah, and uh, that that was seemed to be well, it worked. That's what I was catching them on. That is a big old hook bait, mate. Yeah, I'm wondering whether I didn't catch some of the small carp in there just because of uh, the size of just them. Just because of the size of them. Yeah. Also mechanically, mate, that's a lot of weight. Isn't it is. It? Yeah, they're really weighty. Yeah. What sort of freak? Especially I mean, when I soaked them up in a uh, load of maple. Like. <laughs> it's, like, it's like in a cricket ball. Um, the um, the freebies that you're putting in, mate. I'm guessing they're sort of they ain't forty millers, are they? Eighteens, just eighteens yeah. in the county. Yeah. Interesting. That is a big old bait. It's out of the box, isn't it? Um, talk to me around that sort of same time, that first season, when the reality kicked in that it was going to be tricky. Were you still seeing this, those fish in the in the duck pond? Do you have any more sightings of them or not? Yeah, uh, I think we saw them. I, I tended not to go and look because it wasn't really asked. I thought there was no point spending too much time watching them in the duck pond because that's no benefit to me. Uh, I know they're here now, so I'll just fish for them. There's more. There's more likelihood of if I'm stood in the duck pond staring at these, and the carp angler turns up, he's going to walk straight over, mm. especially if he knows me. I go, all right, Rob, what have you seen? <laughs> you know, oh, it's uh, we just sort of ignored it uh, most of the time. I remember finding a couple of fish up the top end near uh, Peg One uh, in the autumn of that year. If it's, End of September, they were sat near a reed, reed bed on the far bank. It's actually where Miles caught it eventually. Okay, I know what you mean. Up that end. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can get to that area from Peg One. You can reach it, it's not, not a big chuck. Uh, so I thought, oh, I'm going to do the autumn up here. Uh, I'm tired of cycling now. I started taking the bus in from Mac. So right. it was... Uh, well, I lived in town at the time, so I think the bus went from the, the closest to me was near the hospital. So at six in the morning, I'd walk with my gear to the to the hospital bus stop, stand there with all the commuters, get on the bus, and it, it'd go through a few different villages, take about an hour and a half to get there, middle of Nutsford, then walk into the park. So and every day I was on, I was, I'd be on the bus on the way back every day with people had seen on a regular basis that were going to their office jobs. Yeah. Any good today? No, nothing today. Another blank. And you yeah. did that, what, for, for how many days I of the week? I probably did two days a week through to the end of October. Oh, my. Yeah. So that that was, place uh, must be desolate in the winter. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, even looking now, I say to myself, it's still the thing to be done on that place is, is catch... Uh, I know those big ones aren't there anymore, but there's still decent fish in there. Yeah. Oh, mate, that, I think if you catch those fish and whatever fish they are, because it seems that on there, when one's gone, another one sort of superseded it. But the, It'll do big fish again. Exactly. Purely because of that water, isn't yeah. it? It is what it is. But if you can catch one legitimately fishing that days only, mate, that is incredible. Let alone the scale of those fish. At any time, like when when that Tatan Common was in there and it wasn't dead, mega fish. The time that you're talking about here, mega fish in the grand scheme of things with regards to size as well. So, yeah, as a challenge, there's a lot against you, but the accomplishment is absolutely mega. Yeah, the rewards were there, so mm. prepared to put the effort in. How extreme did you have to go, or did you not have to go extreme? Sort of second season, did you start? Second season, same again. We knew, we knew. Uh, we knew they'd visited the spot, so we just carried on as we were. And the second season, I think it was the first week of the season, we caught, I think I had a small common of about 
mid double, upper double, something like that. Uh, so we, that was our that was our first common out of the lake. And then it wasn't long after, maybe three days, I caught Jim's fish, which went on to be one of the big, well, the big one. Mm. <clears throat> uh, Talk to me about that bite. Same area, same? Yeah, same area. It just, it, it, it was always about nine o'clock. It was around the time uh, the rangers come and got your ticket off you, or come and got your money off you for your ticket. It's always seemed to be around nine. Uh off it, well, off it went, screamed off. You know, there's so few and far between on that bites. <laughs> absolutely shit yourself when it rips off. Were you not picking up tench or anything? No, uh, no. It was it was only. I don't know if we ever caught tench on there. It was just hybrids, but they yeah. didn't really tend to scream off. It was just usual breamy type bites. Uh, so off it goes. Powerful run. Uh, usual sort of. Big fish fight, gets it in. Chris nets it, can see it's a common as it goes over the net, a fair size. Uh, he sort of looks back and he's like, yeah, we've got one of the commons. And this is one of the ones we'd seen with the big ones. So we knew, we knew then it was on. So got it out of the water. Uh, effectively, it had been a late record at the time, I suppose, because, well, it was. <laughs> There's the no one's, fishing, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The only one's <laughs> catching carp out of it. Uh, How big did it go? It was 33. Yeah, uh, that's decent. And uh, the Rangers actually turned up while I had it on the bank. Uh, so that was that. And we were paranoid then, I think. And anyone comes on fishing for the day, they're going to say, You should have been here the other week when the uh, <sighs> two lads yeah. had a 33 common. Uh, and then, well, we upped. then only a few days later, Chris gets a take off the spot and it's the same fish. Jim's again? Jim's again, yeah. Jim's again. It's funny how Two Tone's done that and then Jim's has done that. Yeah. And then uh, I think, I feel like Chris had another off the spot and then that was it for a while, till August, end of August. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Yeah, you think you've cracked it. That was always the, the torment we're tatting. You'd think you'd got somewhere. You'd have three or four bites off, off the spot. And then it'd just go dead for months. Yeah, in reality, they've sussed it and they've, yeah, they've, they've gone, haven't they? Or they've just decided to, yeah, they've just been spooked off the area or just mucking about in other areas. Uh, there's a lot of lake for them to <laughs> spend time in, isn't there, on there? Uh, so, yeah, it was it was a slow old summer. After that, and um, yeah, end of August, I think Chris caught it, might have been bite mark off it. A fish that he'd, he'd rescued in the uh, during spawning time as well. It had beached itself. He went for a walk one evening, found him spawning in the duck pond, and this fish had literally beached itself out the water and was, you know, fit to die. Jeez. So he picked it up, took it into the main lake. Stood with it till it came around and swam off, and then that, he was the first person to catch it. What story? Not long is. after, a crack, brilliant picture as well. It, was, it looked stunning at the time. How big did bite mark go? Oh, it's high twenty. I think it. I think it went to mid thirty. Might still be in there. Uh, it didn't get caught very much. It's probably only been caught about. Half a dozen times, something like that. Uh, and then, I think then Chris caught again an old looking 20 that it looked like measles out of, out of yeah. Raysbury. Yeah. Uh, and then, because we used to alternate on the peg either side, just so we, it was kept relatively fair. Uh, and it just so happened I was on, on the side this day and uh, off it ripped, uh, playing this fish. It was it taken about seventy yard line off me. <sighs> Managed to turn it, and it, it was there was good chop on the lake at the time. And this massive tail just waved out the water, full full tail out to the wrist, boom as it turned it over. And we looked at each other. Like, oh, this isn't a bad one. Got it in, and it was uh, it was a smaller of the two fish we'd seen. 
40 pound 10. Oh my days, so, a 40 pounder. 40 pounder, Cheshire record common. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit of a mind blowing day that was. Mate, what are your feelings on that? Because that is, I mean, there's catching big carp. And I mean, nowadays there's a lot known, but when you've got absolutely nothing alone, you've seen them and the fishing has been, let's face it, it's been hard. Yeah. It's been yeah. difficult oh, between absolute bites. graft. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'd had enough by then, you know, I, I sort of took the money and run. I was, I was like, that'll do me. I've had enough of this cycling here. I've had enough of doing days. Uh, and it's really boring fishing because you just, uh, as an angler that likes to move and climb trees and move to show him fish, and you just couldn't do it. You were stuck in, you never saw anything. You just went down, chuck your rods out, Waited. reeled them in, went home uh, day after day. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a barren landscape. It's not the nicest of lakes when you sat there. Day after day. That's why I said winter. So it just, I cannot think yeah. of anywhere where it's just no, desolate. It is. It's like, it's like moorland almost. It's dreadful. Uh, so it, it did grind you down in, in that respect. And as soon as I had that, I said, you're welcome to it, Chris. You know, you stay here and you're doubling your chances. But my rod's not being there, so... What a, what a way to end it as well, though. Like I know that is the smaller one of the two you've seen, but that's still in the context of of everything that you've done there. You found them, you've caught them, and it's a new record that obviously nobody knows about. No, again, because I knew Chris, because Chris was still fishing it, and I didn't mm. tell anybody about it for like two years. Something like that. How do you think it got out then? Oh, when we told when people. When you published it. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just, what yeah, we just told friends that we'd had them and what have you. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what you were doing then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we just waited for Chris to, he caught the other one. Uh, and he'd had enough by that point. So How that big was, was the other one? It was, it was spawned out at 37 <gasps> or 38. I think he might have done him out of a pound there. I'm sure it's 38. But it was still, it was was a big female. He got it out and he was just spewing eggs everywhere. He was thinking, I better weigh this pretty quick here. Uh, Count them, they were in a minute ago. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that, yeah, obviously that was June. That's Uh, incredible, mate. It's an incredible chapter. The actual park itself, any any problems with deer, mate? Any problems with uh, punters and just general public or was it all generally okay? Uh, yeah, it was just for a part of the, the usual sort of Labrador, just coming over your shoulder and jumping into the lake through your lines. Nice. Yeah, that was that was the odd thing about it. You know what that bank's like. Mm. You've got a thousand yard of bank, yet the owners would come and chuck balls in your swim. <laughs> You'd yeah, watch them come you. walking down, and they wouldn't they wouldn't chuck the ball or the stick into the lake until they got near you. Boom, a stick had come over your shoulder, followed by a. Uh, the dog. You did the winter as well. No rutting season well, madness. No. We, we no we didn't we never fish we didn't do the winter. The I did autumn. it I did it later in the in in a revisit. I, I, I did a February March on there. Didn't catch anything. Uh, <laughs> what made you go back? I don't know. I, 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 well, I, I do know because it had fifty pound commons yeah, in it at the time, pounds, yeah. especially the one I hadn't had. Uh, mm. But yeah, I didn't uh, didn't catch it. That's for sure. It's been a bit of a feature. You gone back, back to Reeds, me back to Tat, and the call of the northwest. Always, mate. yeah, always dipping and out. Mm. It's like Cape Thorn. I never stopped fishing Cape Thorn. Uh, I'd, I'd sort of do a few trips a year, or uh, do a week in the autumn, things like that. Right up until I stopped fishing, I was, I was still fishing Cape Thorn. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. Interesting, isn't it? The call of home, I suppose, isn't it? Really? Yeah, it's just nostalgia, isn't it? You. Yeah. Yeah. Dip in for a bit of nostalgic fishing. Tatton, done. Well, a mega chapter, like unbelievable. Yeah, I'm not like you say about that. And it is formative. It's put it on the map. Since then, subsequently, you've talked about Miles's capture. You've talked about other anglers that have gone and fished Tatton for those fish. Fish have died. Others have superseded them. It is what it is. It's, it's a massively established chapter. People have done more and more extreme things to get those fish caught as well. You've done it. 
yeah, off the bat, pretty megaly in, in a legitimate way. W- what was then the call carp fishing wise? Because northwest wise, you've caught a forty pounder, you've had a Cheshire record. The probability of finding something to surpass that in the locality is is minimal. Yeah, yeah. What, what are you going to do? There, there weren't any other big. You're kind of getting a taste for big fish there, uh, and it, it being such a difficult lake. Uh, you've kind of fallen into that groove of that kind of fishing, if you know what I mean. Uh, Is that what did it? Is that what sort of really stamped that big carp element into you? Maybe. I've certainly not fished anywhere as hard as Tartan since. That was... Was that really the hardest? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot against you in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the logistics. With a lot of these lakes, as you know yourself, it's your big lakes... it's 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 the scenarios that that create that I mean, fish are fish, carp are carp, aren't they? They don't really change much. Uh, they just swim and eat, really. Mm. So, yeah, small lakes they can be condi- they're fairly conditioned from the amount of pressure they get. But if you take all those people off, those carp will become quite catchable quite quickly, won't they? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'd uh, I've sort of I'd, I was going down that road then. And I knew lads from Reedsmere had been on uh, Stone Acres, but I knew about that place. So we decided to go and have a look at that. And I think me and Chris did... did You're a, driving at the time, yeah? Yeah, I'm driving by okay. this time, yeah, eventually. I was going to say, you ain't cycling down there, boy. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, actually, the first year I was on Tatton, a friend of mine wanted to go for a trip on Stoneacre. It was day ticket. Mm. I didn't, I, I'd been saying, oh, I'm not fishing. I've not been fishing anywhere. So, uh, so I kind of agreed in a way to sort of, because I couldn't really get out of it. It's like, let's, let's go. I said, I'll come for a session down there with you then. So we did, we did four or five nights on Stoneacre. Nobody else on the lake at this point. It wasn't a, wasn't a busy lake at the time, so this had been two thousand and three, uh, and fuck, I think what amazed me was I'd, I'd found the fish in the in the bays between it was Island Point and and uh, Big Point, and virtually the stock of big fish were there. So as a northerner looking at, I think oh. the, I think the biggest in there was mid forty at the time, but there was. It was probably three or four forties, uh, and them mooching about with some upper thirties in there, all in this little bay. That's the whole of the northwest, isn't yeah. It, really? And I'm thinking, I'm just looking at them from me to the table away. All the effort I'm putting in <laughs> up there, and you've got times five <laughs> in front of me here, just ambling about, looking quite catchable. Mm. They weren't that catchable that day, but as it appeared, but. Uh, you kind of think to yourself, what, 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 what's it all about? So uh, that was my first foray onto there. And the lad I was with caught the biggest common in the lake that week, uh, 42. Wow. It was one, I don't know if you ever saw it, one that John Finch had, quite a spawny common. But no. He'd been talking about it all week. And then on the last evening, off it rips, and it's this common, a 42. <sighs> And so, again, I'm looking at this 42 common. I think, you've just come down here and banged that out. And I'm putting all this effort in for a similar-sized fish. Uh, it's not on, mate. I'm no, coming down but here. I but I, I think I was just more, when I'd seen that, I think I was just more driven on on Tatton at the time, thinking, oh, I've got a couple of them that I'm fishing for. I'm going to catch them. So, after Tatton, uh, it was... It rolled quite conveniently into Stoneacre. What years are we in? We're early 2000s, are we? Yeah. Actually, it was 03, yeah. 03, 04 on town. Yeah. And then I had a year of flitting about where I was fishing. <clears throat> I'll not say too much about it. Uh, it's, a, it's a syndicate nowadays. It was a lake that was, was no fishing uh, at all. It was a private lake. Uh, and I was doing a little bit on there, uh, caught, 
cut a few, so I don't know whether it, they, they were they were uncaught or not because it was fished in the eighties. Right. Some really old chestnut coloured commons and mirrors between I don't know twenty and low thirty. A few of them, really nice fishing, uh, but you know you're sneaking in and out in dark, mm. uh, being hidden away. Was that and one then, you heard about on the grapevine? Yeah, that was one yeah. I'd heard about on the grapevine. Uh, I think I did. Somebody had snuck on and had a 30 leather out of it. Uh, so I thought I'd go and have a look at it. Didn't know anything about it other than what we did on there. Mm. Uh, and then did a bit on top flash. I think I did the winter. Uh, winter on top flash. Uh, How was that? Didn't, but it was uh, interesting. Like it was again day only. Yeah. So you, driving over there, doing the days, it it flooded up and down with the river. Uh, the field down to it was like it was the muddiest I've ever, oh. approach I've ever had to take to a lake. So you'd be carrying your kit in chesties because it's winter. Uh, up to your knees in mud. It's quite a steep hill as well, so when you're coming back up it, it was a bit of a it's bit quite of a drain. Long, mate. How long is it? It's quite a walk, isn't it? Yeah, it's a fair walk, yeah. That's yeah. not. And that when it would be in flood, because it was baiting the far bank, you were up to your chest in water, holding your bed chair and your chair above you, above your head as you as you waded round through all this flood water to get to get to your swim. Uh <clears throat> but it was I'd had every intention of staying on there for a bit because it had the big common in at the time, mm. which was like, I think it had done 39 that September. So you're you thinking know, it's going to be bigger than... You're thinking yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. due to do 40. And uh, I think it was it was a poor winter. Not much got caught. I had two-tone quite quickly. That was my first fish out of there. Uh, like the second biggest in the lake at uh, 32. 35 something <clears throat> and then another one before Christmas a mid 20 uh, and then I can't remember what month it was I think it was Feb- end of February it had a massive fish kill mm. something that had washed into the lake from the surrounding land for, yeah. yeah yeah, from the surrounding farmland I presume and it, it just decimated most of them all the big ones uh, which is just devastating, really, uh, for the lake. Now, from that brief stint on Top Flash, you decided <clears> to <throat> take the real plunge. You did a, a day session or a, a little four-day flurry down at Stoneacres before, but you decided to make the big move down there and concentrate some time fishing Stoneacres. Talk me through that decision, what the complex was like upon your sort of first arrival down there, mate. Well, we went down for a day ticket session in February, Uh Fletch was running the, the site at the time and uh, we got chatting to him and we knew lads that were fishing down there. Uh, Paul Ankers, he was fishing there. He was pretty good friends with Fletch and said, you know, these lads would like a ticket. And he come round, he said, uh, apply for a ticket in a month or so and uh, should be able to sort you out, you two. Uh, so that was, you know, it was on then. We were, we were made up with that. Uh, so from that spring onwards, March, we started travelling down there and uh, that was us on Stoneacre, first year down there. How was uh, that, mate? At the time, you are able to use a boat to bait up, aren't you? Yeah, you could uh, You could use a boat. Uh, you'd go out, find your spots, block them. Really, really weedy at the time. Mm. That season was, was, it was, the, it was the weediest of the three seasons I fished it. Uh, you couldn't drop though, could you? Could you drop rigs? No, you couldn't drop. wasn't dropping. It had been dropping in the past, and obviously, it, it ended. It ended up dropping in the future. Mm. I don't know what year. Uh, so you were that casting. Changed. So we were casting. Yeah. Uh, so it was all casting the spots, and we didn't have any boat, so we had to sort a boat out in the run up to that. Uh, we commandeered a friend's who'd been banned for dropping, actually. Uh, so obviously he went and we said, well, can we use your boat? <laughs> you don't need that, mate. Seeing as it's uh, obsolete <laughs> to you now. Uh, and uh, 
Yeah, so we went down there. And because we were from up north and a couple of northerners had been doing a bit of dropping on there, straight away we were suspects. You know, the, the eyes were on us by the locals uh, straight away. Uh, so... How did you know that? Were, you, were, you, were they in your swim a lot? Was yeah, there... the, and the... the They'd say things, you know. You knew you were, you knew you were under suspicion, but we were all right at long range fishing, and it wasn't really getting done on there. Certainly not to the extent it, it did end up getting done. When you say long range, what are we talking here? Hundred yards plus? Uh, yeah, or there, longer? there wasn't many people fishing over hundred yards. There was a couple of lads that had spots up to about one forty. Uh, the dug ups that were. Uh, Adam and Tim, they were fishing the tits and the hump, uh, tits and the bins. And they they were sort of in that, so those swims every week, all week. Uh, and they were fishing at, I think, I think Adam's spot was about just over 100. Tim's was probably 140. But, you know, we could fish to 160 quite comfortably. Was that because of reeds, mister? Or just yeah, not- probably reeds, me. Uh, but, just long range fishing over the years, uh, so well, I I used to like just making a point of when some of the locals were they'd, they'd congregate in one area having a few beers in the evenings, flat calm evening. I'd go and put some blocks in and just thump a lead into the middle of them, so you could blatantly show in you can you, cast that you far. can cast that far. It wasn't an issue. Accuracy wasn't an issue. I had no no reason to drop, uh, so. After that, it wasn't too bad. They knew, they knew we weren't up to anything, uh, so it just we just cracked on like that. Really, the fishing on there. Obviously, you talked before about sort of observing carp and the old top lake at Cape Swan, but but here where you've got the benefit of a boat spots, it's very weedy. What was that like in terms of a dimension to your angling? Was it pretty revolutionary? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd used boats in the past, but never to that extent. Uh, never being able to view the bottom with glass bottom buckets mm. uh, and, and look at spots, uh, look at what fish had done to spots, look at what fish, look at what bait hadn't been eaten. Uh, There's just so many facets to it that I hadn't uh, encountered in the past. And, and with it being so weedy uh, and being casting, uh, as the summer went on, the, the the areas you could fish were dwindling. It, you know, there was huge swathes of the lake. That it was just top to bottom, 12, so, 15 feet of water, and, and the weeds just lying across the top, acres and acres of it. Uh, so in the end, that you know that I, I worked that to my favour with raking. Uh, but did you? Yeah. But so is, it, that, is that how you overcame that then? No, not that first year. I just fished. I just fished, found spots, uh, kept an eye on the fish, and the fish would open up small areas, and being able to fish effectively at range and accurately, I could fish areas people couldn't get to, you know, people things people couldn't land a lead on. But you'd, you'd end up... You could spend all day casting at these spots sometimes. And that's one thing about looking from a boat uh, in 10 to 15 foot of water. You might land it straight straight in the middle of the blocks, but you'd get there and it'd be in the weed. Or it, it'd gone in a completely, entirely different area of the, the uh, of the spot where you thought it had landed. Uh, so that that spot could, that, that could uh, go on and on and on till you got it exactly where you wanted it. Sort of a spot within a spot sometimes. Uh that's not easy. I'm Other times to... you could get it in the first cast. I'm trying to think of like, you've got a lot of conditions in terms of wind. You've obviously got tow as well. You've got breaking at wee bed. You've got loads of different obstacles yeah. that, well, that in essence, it's going to make life pretty aggy. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Wind, cross winds, they were a nightmare. Uh, you, could, you couldn't swing it down onto these spots that were the size of a, a table uh, because... You couldn't he- let it down because as soon as you put tension on it, that bow in the wind would just pull it at an arc off the spot. So you had to kind of let it go and then just live with that bow in your line that would just be on top of right. floating weed on the way and stuff like that. And it is sometimes limit how many rods you put out. There's days when I, when I was just fishing one rod 
because I could only get one rod on on a spot. And that's a spot the size of a dinner table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you, when you talk about crosswinds, when you talk about hitting spots, you talked there a little bit about leaving the bow in the line, which would be horrible, but it is what it is if you want to be on that spot, which I completely get. What allowances did you have to make for, for crosswinds? Did you have to sort of increase the actual where your clip was, for example, to hit the same spot? Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd have to sort of step into it. Right. You know, to, to just take that uh, shock out of it as it, as it went down. Uh, it was always a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, Stone Acres is four-rod water, and I never, ever used four rods on it because it was such a pain in the arse getting three in. And you think to yourself, I don't, I don't want that much activity in the swim. So, I mean, Chris, uh, he, he, I think he used two rods the whole time he was on there. Wow. Yeah. Did, is it, was it a case of you, in terms of areas and your spots that you're saying, was it a case of you primarily looking at where the fish are showing, finding a spot within that realm and then fishing most of the rods on that? Or did you spread them about a fair bit? Or did you have areas that you consistently tried to bake? Because I know, I don't know how busy it is at this time <coughs> when you got on there. Uh, it, it was a busy lake. Mm. Uh by this time, it had got popular, uh, especially in the spring. Because you had the other two lakes there, April and May being some of the busiest months uh, mm. on the bank, those those lakes would fill up and Stone Acres would be the overspill. So you 2025 20, lads I'd counted. Few times, jeez, mate. Yeah, that adds another dimension into your angling, especially on a <clears throat> already quite difficult, unique venue. <clears throat> but as soon as the weed got really bad and after spawning, it it, it always did quiet and often you had your, your regulars just then on there. Then. Stock wise, in there was it choco times? Was it sort of your main target, <clears throat> or was it was it? Well, there was a good stock. Was there bite mark and all those? Yeah, bite there? mark was in there. Uh, choco, the leather. Uh, Chernobyl, Bungle's Linear, uh, Kev's Linear was just coming on the scene at mm. Upper 30. Uh, fish called Lawrence hadn't been out for a bit and that was sort of on the missing list, but in hindsight it was dead, but people thought it was still there. Yeah. Uh, I think there was about, about about half a dozen 40s in there at the time, which just sounds nothing these days, does it? No, it's still a decent... Yeah, considering the quality of the fish and... They were all that sort of classic Oxford strain. So it was just wall-to-wall linears. Mm, heavily plated yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Every, every other fish was a, a, like a 27 linear. <laughs> <laughs> spots, mate. You talked about spots and, and sort of being able to observe them. What a spot that had sort of paid well for you was it did you fish smaller and smaller spots? Did you see bigger areas that were clear? You talked about the <clears> weed growth. Did you see what decimation there was when they turned over your spot or what, what talk to me about the observation there around sort of the spots that worked and, and when they were prime, <laughs> etc. Yeah. The, I mean, it, it, it sounds straightforward, but the, the obvious spots would be ones that you'd see them showing one morning, go out and look after they'd left and they tore up a section of weed bed, you know, sort of 10 by 10, you know, and that would be a good spot. Yeah, you get a rod on that, and chances are you'd catch off it. Uh, plenty of times you didn't. They never. Mm. Sometimes they never returned back to those spots. But sometimes you'd find these spots that they they turned over. Uh, a lot of the time they were in onion weed. Okay. And uh, they'd carry on producing for the rest of the year for everybody, you know. Uh, and then you had your main gravel areas that did stay clean. Uh, they'd be the ones you'd kind of get on in bad conditions because you knew you could get rods on them. Okay. Uh, and you would catch off them. But considering the amount of rod hours they got, they weren't productive spots. Do you ever fish in the weed itself, mate? Uh, no, but, because it, it was, it's a bit all or nothing, the weed. Yeah. It's like you're either on a clear spot or it's touching the top in 12 foot of water. There was nothing in between. It there was no solid. low lying areas. No, no, not really, no. No, uh, fair days. What we did catch was early on that first spring, we were catching on off the lead pop ups. You where, love it, you love yeah, an off yeah. the lead pop up, didn't you? Yeah, the, the early zigs. 
<clears throat> so we were catching on them, fishing over all the diet, all the dead stuff from the winter that had yeah. bundled up and stuff. We, you go over it in the boat and you see that it's sort of like two, three foot max. So you, you're fishing two, two and a half foot uh, off the lead pop ups, just whacked out at what you see. What was your hooking arrangement then? Just a hair rig and a pop up? Yeah, just a hair rig, yeah. Just a. You're not still on the old B. No, old B Christ, no, no. Yeah? No, since I, well, since I opened a couple up on the Reed's Mirror, I didn't. Uh, oh, is that where they didn't went? Didn't go back. Oh, they, yeah, they went in the bin after that. <laughs> Fair play. The um, <clears throat> the sort of a general approach rig wise. Did you have to refine anything or change anything with with in terms of rigs on those spots? Or I was putting... having. I had a, I had a bit of trouble with losses on, on the, in the first year. So it was. It's the old conundrum of <clears throat> when you're happy with something and then you start losing fish. You start trying every hook on the market, don't you? You lose a few more and then you don't know what you're doing. Mm. Uh, so I think I just went back to continental boilie hooks and, okay. uh, and that was doing the job. Bottom baits or pop-ups? Bottom baits? Uh, bottom baits primarily. And then I'd always fish a pop-up on, on like my third rod mm. and a few times I just saw it getting cleaned out. I'd fucking, I'd go out and everything I put round it had gone. Numerous times, I was like, God. Oh. So I dropped down, I, I put all rods on 18 mil bottom baits uh, and Dren, Dren Super Specialist braid. Right. Uh, and straight away, I was catching shitloads of tench, really? not getting cleaned out while well, catching carp and not, not seeing my hook baits cleaned out. So Always match the hatch, never a bright one <laughs> on the bottom, never any sort of tipper yeah, or anything no, like no, that. No, 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 no. Yeah, just uh, straight out the uh, straight out the bag. And th- this time, are you still mainline, or have you gone to your own your own concoctions? Uh, first year, I was still mainline. Okay. Uh, second year, I'd have been making my own by then. I, I, well, back making my own bait. Yeah. That must be harrowing going out there, seeing fish activity, and then <laughs> just seeing your pop up and everything else gone. That's pretty bad, mate, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, you, the glass bottom book, it's like putting a microscope over it all, mm. isn't it? It's, it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit soul destroyed. But it could have been tench, you know. It's, there was plenty of them in there. Uh, yeah. So. You can consolidate yourself you with exactly, the potential. Yeah, that tench. Was, was all tench. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, captures that first that first year. What 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 sticks out? Well, it's a little bit for, a little bit muddied. The old memory is, but the first year, did I have? I was trying to think what I had the first year. It was a good year. I had uh, twenty odd fish out of there. Mm. Uh, I think I caught. I think that I, I reckon that big common was uh, was probably one of the standouts, and. The bus had the bus the first year as well. You had the bus. That is a yeah. mega looking cart, mate, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's a belter, isn't it? It's Long. Like, a, like an ironing board with scales. <laughs> <laughs> what weight was that when you had it? Uh, 37. Uh, thought it was a bream. What, didn't do anything? I wound it in to the point it was beached. I didn't, I just went out, uh, winding what, like, you, you, stone acres at that time. You had to land carp from the boat or you weren't getting them in. Yeah, they just go solid in the weed? Yeah, just in the weed, solid, get in the boat, pluck them out the weed, play them around for a bit and then net them. Uh, on this occasion, it was a typical bream bite, you know, a little drop back, up to the top, down, up to the top, middle of the night, gets out, winds this bream in, all the way in, you know what it's like with bream, you wind them into the edge or knock them. I know all too well. <laughs> Uh, so I'm expecting glide this slab into six inch of water and it stops. Were they big bream in there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So 1712 was the biggest out of there. Oh, Lord. So they, they, they grew a bit in that place. <clears throat> Probably average. I think the shoal was, I don't know, they never saw anything under 12 pound. Yeah, they 12, bream, 12, they? To, 12 to, 12 to, I think one of them might have done 20. <laughs> Which sounds incredible. Just, just saying, just saying that word twenty, twenty pound and bream. But 
yeah, just expecting it to just glide into my feet and pop the hook and send him back on his way. And it stopped. So I just turned my head torch on. And there he is, laying in the margin. So I quickly grabbed the net and I had to literally scrape it underneath him. That is... <laughs> Like the fact that you've got it through that much distance, yeah, all that as way. well. Yeah, like so you're not fishing two yards out. 120, something like that. I'd brought him. Didn't, he did nothing. He looked. Didn't, did he, did he the, 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 the line didn't even kite left or right, just in a straight line, all the way in. <laughs> he must have gone. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a mega fish. He's definitely one of the characters still there today, to this very day, mate. Yeah, he's still I, going. I caught him on my last season as well. Uh, but he really scrapped that session. Yeah, that, that, that time. Yeah, crazy. It was a boat battle. Uh, but yeah, there was that. And uh, towards the end, of, towards the autumn, I was fishing off crows. I think it was up. It might have been late October, mid or late October. Mm. <clears throat> and we've been seeing uh, decent sized commons through the summer. And big commons hadn't been caught out of there mm. since the spawny common was in there. Uh, I know a few lads thought they'd seen a 40 common in it. We'd seen this long common around mid-30 and then an, an upper-30 common, a chunky one. It, when you looked at it in the water, it, you, you you could think it was 40 pound. Uh, and then it was on crows one night. It was just going dark. And uh, my left hander ripped off, went out this sort of, Long boat battle with this fish, and next minute, this great big common popped up, netted it, looked in the net, and I did. whenever you're out in a boat, fish always look a bit bigger. Yeah. This fucking common looked enormous. Oh, Jesus Christ. Gets it back to the bank, weighs it, uh, I think it was 37 something. That's so, a big old. Oh, yeah, common, it was a big common for there. Uh, so I did a few self takes and slipped him back. Uh, but that was the other thing about that place. I mean, that spot was <sighs> probably about 90 yard, but it was a really small spot, about the size of an walking mat. So I just hooked it up in the eyes, uh, just hooked the rod up in the eyes because there's no point even trying to cast to something that size. So when you get something like that, you you weren't recasting. No, you're done. Yeah, you're done until the morning. Yeah. yeah. For you on there, you talked about, and you referenced it slightly earlier, I mean, that's an incredible start and you've hit the ground running and done real well. But you talked a little bit about raking spots mm. as well. Now, obviously in a modern day scene, there's a lot of weed that's about, there's a lot of venues and I see a very few people doing it, but it's definitely an edge on really weedy venues to be able to rake them. Your experience raking and spots on success on Stone Acres, what, what are we talking? Well, with with Stone Acres, you've got the advantages of the boat. Uh, so straight away, that's a... That's a big edge when it comes to raking. Uh, so me and Chris had thought it'd be an idea to rake the spot, a uh, rake a spot one autumn, and just start, you know, bait it and uh, see what comes of that. So we hatched a plan. Uh, I went and bought, I think, about 150 meters of rope. We had this great big rake that my mate Brian had left there uh, that was, was about four foot long. Great big bits of threaded bar through it, uh, both sides. So it's six, seven inch bits of threaded bar. It was a fair old bit of kit. Some agricultural, yeah, landscaping yeah, yeah, going on. Like you could plough a field with it. Uh, and uh, so we'd just go out, drop a couple of blocks. I'd tie a water bottle to it on a length of rope, the depth of the water, so I knew where it was. Mm. Uh drop it at the back of the intended spot where the blocks were. I'd tie it to a car to get it, get the... Uh, you tie it to a car? Yeah, because the weed was that thick to get it. That's the other benefit of stone it, because you had the car on the bank. So I'd say to Chris, you know, I'd go and drop it at the back of this marked spot, tell him to drive, so, and then just wave when I wanted him to stop. So the water bottle would be going oh for 15 feet. I'd be like, stop go to the water bottle, pull the rake up, strip it all off, repeat. back of the spot, and repeat and repeat and repeat. And uh, about half a day's work, you had a, a nice big clean gravel spot. And uh, 
it worked virtually immediately. You'd, when we went, went home that week, obviously we put a load of bait on it. People said they'd seen fish showing there mm. over the weekend. So they were straight in on it to see what, what had been kicked up. It must be a massive sign. If you're drifting around there and you see a load of like displaced water, all that sort of substrate, bits of food and everything coming off the weed, you, you're going to go and investigate what's kicked yeah, off well, we, there. Yeah, well, we you? picked one of the densest areas that was in an area where there'd been no clear spot all summer for acres of water. So it's just a massive impact there and then for them. It must have been a massive, dense patch because if you're pulling back for half a day with a car, <laughs> a car it's not yeah. like you've got a little casting yeah. rake out for a couple of hours. That is <laughs> that is pretty agricultural, mate. You, you said fish activity straight away, bites off that spot uh, as soon as you fished yeah, it? Yeah, first trip on. I can't remember who fished it first. With. I think it was Chris. I think he caught straight away off it. Yeah. And was that, I'm guessing it's quite... That's what I caught the bus off as well the first time. Oh, was it? Yeah. A rake spot, fair dude. Yeah. Was it quite respected in terms of if you'd done that, people had seen that, they'd leave it as uh, you? They didn't know we'd seen it because we left it to a day when there was no one on. It was, it was a good changeover on, a, I think it was a Thursday. Uh, so that's when we did it. Uh, but obviously they saw people saw was catching off it mm. and they did fish it, which we learned from that the following time and I did it a lot further out the next time I did it. Oh, where uh, people couldn't reach? Yeah. Well, the majority anyway. Yeah. Uh, but that year, there'd been some bait left on it. It wasn't ours. And it had, it had jellied up and started rotting. And the spot was starting to grow this fungus on it. And there was like, there was a big, uh, massive long pole that was left there in, in the area where everyone kept the boats. And it had a, a two foot piece of metal on the end that's like a big rake I suppose and I used to take that out drag all this fucking scum and shit off off the spot it dropped down into a trough at the beginning of it beginning of the spot so I was still getting takes off the back of the spot where the gravel was clean but eventually this mould just fucking covered the spot and that was it done but you, even after autumn. even after moving that that yeah. stuff, you were still getting bites. Every, every, every what, it probably it was probably over only half a dozen trips, but I the first thing I'd do when I got there was back this mould up back down into the front trough with this. Uh, and what bait was it? Just boily? What was it? It was boily, and it was uh, it was. Remember that large hemp that the, the, there was like the giant giant hemp. hemp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a giant hemp. I was like. Just put this shite on here, <laughs> and it. <laughs> what did you put out when you went? Just neat boily. I I used to fish uh, boily with a bit of hemp, bit of but not hemp. giant. No, 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 not a gi- giant. Seed. Not this giant fucking carp proof stuff. <laughs> carp repellent. Yeah, carp repellent hemp. That's yeah. crazy that you got bites just from scraping all that back because you, you wouldn't have got bites if you just left that there. I don't think so. No, because what happened was when. You'd get you'd get takes in the area, and uh, as you know, it just, stuff just gets lifted in the water. Mm. So boily and what have you, it'd settle in this stuff. Once it settled in it, it wasn't getting it wasn't getting eaten at all. It was certainly something I noticed the second year as well when it was really busy. Uh, people were dumping buckets of boily on spots before they left. You know, just yeah. as they were boating back, they go, oh, "That's a nice spot, dumping it." And you'd find, you'd see that after about four days, if they didn't get eaten, that seemed to be the time period, four days to a week. If it hadn't gone by then, it wasn't going to go. And then it'd just jelly up and destroy these spots. You've got four days Even, to even a week. like the year after, when it, had, when it looked like clear gravel, no one had ever seemed to get a take off these spots again. As if they were completely tainted. You'd think that would go back to starting again and be you would, all right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's odd, isn't it? Mm. Um, captures again. Choco. Did you have Choco? Yeah. Go yeah. on. The, was yeah. it fifty pound or not? Yeah, yeah. It was. Oh. Uh, it was Oxford record at the time. Fifty two, fifty two and a half. Talk me through that capture, mate. Cause that's a special <clears> fish. Well, that was that was my last year on the, the my third year. Uh, 
I don't think you. Yeah, that was off. That was off another raked spot. I uh, at the end of my third year, I thought I'm going to do another raked spot. So I hadn't done one the second year, and uh, I think I did. I think I raked it in the the August. Yeah, the August end of August. <clears throat> Start baited it for two weeks and dropped on it and had Kev's off it straight away on the first trip on. So I knew it was a go with that. Had you seen that fish in the area or not? No, I'd not seen him. No, no. Wow. Uh, and then a little bit down the road, I'd had a few fish off it. I'd, I'd seen Chocker on it while I was playing a smaller fish. You'd, oh, no way. What, just and literally feed just, it? You, no, just, moving just, away. just swimming alongside it while I was playing it out of the boat. Uh, and then on the, on the full moon, Chocker had a, had a liking for the full moons. Uh, the morning of, he showed on the back of the spot. It ripped off at tenish, I think. And uh, I'm out there playing it. As soon as it gets it up in view, I can see it's the big fella. Uh, so, boat battle commenced for fifteen or twenty minutes with that. Got scooped him up. Uh, was quite close to the island at the time, so I scooted over to the island. Got on into the margin, unhooked him, put him in the boat, wrapped him up in the mat, mm. scooted back. Uh, all the lads met me on the bank and uh, we weighed and photographed him. Uh, kind of my time done on there then. How, how how many times did it come out at fifty pound or over before you caught it? Uh, t- t- try to think now. I'm asking I'm not you to too tell sure. Brian. I'm not too sure. But it wasn't the it, first time it, it did fifty, it, was it? It might. It had been out in the spring. It had been out in the spring the year before at Scraper Fifty. Okay. When Jimmy had it, I think that might have been its first time at fifty. Uh, Mate, it's an incredible so fish. Three, three, maybe three times. Might not even be that. I, Really can't remember. But another record for you, mate. You've done it up north and then you've done it down south, mate. Generally on there, the the um, the sort of atmosphere, I know that initially there was this sort of dropping thing and a bit of eyes on you, but over the course of that time... Yeah, that settled down. I mean, yeah. As soon as this was, we were, we, we were sound and we weren't there uh, to muck about uh, breaking rules. You know, I, I was quite satisfied that I caught all mine casting, you know. If it was, if you were allowed dropping on there, to dropped, but, but I didn't. Uh, so I became good mates with some of the locals, like uh, Mark Chivers, mm. great guy. Uh, he was the bailiff at the time. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a good time down there. I really enjoyed it. Some incredible fish and some very stunning fish. fish as well. yeah. yeah, stunning fish. What? Well, obviously, you caught Choco. Was did it at this point? Did it? Was Choco a target per se, or were you just the usual <laughs> fishing it, catch what you catch, and you're happy? Yeah, yeah. Well, it became a target like they like they always seem to. Uh, but it is the kind of lake where the, the quality of fish you catch, and you're just happy to catch as many as you can. Uh, and obviously, those big fish will, will, will turn up in the end. Was a bit worried they wouldn't at one point. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I, I was, I was, I was catching well on there, but just not getting amongst the better fish. Well, why do you think that is? Forties. Why do you think that is? Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Perhaps just bad luck, uh, because it wasn't. I mean, we 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 collected a load of pictures together of uh, of everything we could in there, and we we reckoned there was about 80, 80 fish in it. Mm. Uh, so there wasn't loads and, you know, I was catching fairly regular. Uh, you didn't really do anything. I mean, you raked a new spot, but you, other than that, you didn't change anything else really between those years on there? That no, was... no. I fished spots that big fish came from, I, you know, I, I caught all over the lake, all around the lake. Uh, it was just one of them things. You went to your bait though, didn't you? you yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, I was, uh. I was having uh, I was having a few chats with with other lads on that second year that you know were big fish anglers like Terry and Gary Lewis and a few others. 
Mm. And we were talking about green lip muscle powder, uh, and they were saying how it's they they'd been using it a lot and saying how it seemed to pick out the better fish. And they they were adamant that it was a good ingredient for that. So I thought, sod it, I'm making a bait up that's loaded with it, and that's what I did in the end. And that, that, that I, I think I caught nearly thirty fish that second year on that one. Among and with some of the big ones as well, you know, like Kev's, the bus again, Choco, uh, and that that was a bait that <laughs> that uh, did well for me for years to follow after that. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, but I, I caught Choco on a bird food. Did you? And yeah, it was. <clears throat> I tend to. I, I've always changed over at the birdies when when the temperature drops. Okay. Yeah. For a bit of digestibility. And the beauty of Stoneacre was, especially a spot that I was catching off regular, you could you you could do that experiment visually as well, and uh, using this fish meal to the point where you start getting those cooler autumn nights, mm. and the water clarity just changes. You can tell that all the microbes just disappear into the weed with the temperature drop. The fish meals were starting to get left. They weren't going with the same vigour. Uh, so I thought, sod it, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get on the birdies. So I did a, a nice cranberry liver and GLM bird food. And the uh, first trip down, put quite a bit of it in. And all of it went and caught a couple. Uh, same again the next trip. It was going, you know, mm-hmm. nothing was getting left. So it, it, it definitely seemed to make the difference. And then the next trip down, I had him on it. Your bait, we talked about it before, mate. You talked about rolling stuff before. You talked about that whole thing. Bait for you became, well, a bit of a gift and a curse, mate, wasn't it? Something that you you benefited from in your own angling, your own sort of uniqueness and, and skill set to be able to take that on and make. But it then sort of spiralled into a bait company, maybe that yeah. you never really wanted to start, but that had massive high regard within a lot of top anglers, especially in the Northwest initially, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It, it just escalated. It was uh, from making my own bait to the point where friends were saying, could you mind making me some? I'm like, no, no worries, it'll pay for my bait for the season. And then their mates would want some. And it, it just grew like that uh, into the, to the point where I had a unit and I was, I was selling it. <laughs> Like, but it was it was it was good to see, uh, see people catching on stuff I'd come up with, you know, doing well on waters, being the main bait on 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 waters it was being used on. Uh, it was you know it was it, that was satisfying. That affinity to bait, that sort of development process, that that cause it's not as easy just going in knocking a few ingredients together and whacking it out. You've got to have some idea of quantities, levels, measures, flavorings, everything in order to make a bait work. Yeah, where did that all yeah. come from? It, just over the years of, of doing my own stuff over the years since I was a kid. But it's not. It isn't that complicated. It really isn't. It's you. You learn what binds what. You know what's going to be attractive to fish. Uh, you can just you just get a feel for it over the years, mm. and it's it's it just it is fairly easy to knock up really. I think it's fairly easy for you, mate. There's a lot <laughs> of um a lot of understating your ability there. I certainly wouldn't be able to just knock up a few things and it be any form of palatable to a car, mate. That would <laughs> be that would be your giant hemp, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Nightmare yeah. situation. Yeah. Sam's been on with a giant hemp. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There's yeah. the mould. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> you um your your sort of process within that sort of relatively organic bait business. Surely there's a point at which that is taking up massive swathes of your time mate isn't it yeah it's it's like any business it it doesn't finish at five o'clock you've you've you're meeting people uh when they finish work in the evenings you're uh you're working out the orders for the next day you've got people messaging you till midnight sometimes what are uh, your best messages mate come on you must have had some belters uh, uh some like to message on a Saturday night, uh, Friday night, you could tell that it was like pub time and they'd been thinking about the fishing. 
because they'd put an order in and then you'd have to contact them in the week say, I've done that 10 key for you, mate. Uh, what 10 key? Oh, no. <laughs> you get stuff like that, yeah. As I said, be- the, as I said 20, be- the 20 millers. Yeah, the as I said one, before, mate. somebody rang me up and said, what size are your 20 millers? Uh, <laughs> Go on, boy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the wafters aren't wafting. Uh, it's, you know, first thing in the morning. The life of a bait game, mate. But yeah. you, you also, am I right in saying that you also offered like <laughs> bespoke mixes, didn't you, as well? Yeah, that was probably a mistake. You mudder. You used to, uh, because being a little cottage in, cottage industry uh, bait company, you kind of thought it was your duty to offer people uh, custom mixes, but you'd sort of like get people asking for a custom one kilo mix. <laughs> Of 12s, 14s, and 16 millies or something, and you think, fucking hell. <laughs> It'd take you like two hours to earn two quid. Yeah, <laughs> not worth it, mate. Uh, but yeah, it was all fun and games. Uh, as I'm sure everybody that in that in that game uh, knows awful too, all too well. You, at this stage, when you're talking about going down south, the, the sort of travel commitments of going down there, fishing, uh, that type of venue where realistically you're not doing an overnighter and then going, you may have done, but I'm guessing they're slightly longer sessions. What, 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 what's that, the reality of that, mate? Because that is, that is graft, mate. Yeah, it, it does grind you down through the season. It's, I think, a lot of the time where certain waters, you'd, <clears throat> you wouldn't mind doing a winter on there. But you end up using the winter as a rest to, like a closed season to recuperate and uh, get your drive back up again for the following spring. Uh, like Stoney, so th- at the time it felt like it could be quite doable in the winter, but a lot of times you just didn't have the uh, didn't have it, the go in you left for after driving back and to from Oxford every week from March to to October. Hammers you, mate. I've done a lot of driving, and and I know that it is definitely if you're a northerner traveling, or if you're not a northerner, that is very sort of zone Pacific. You could be a, a southerner traveling up, but if you're doing yeah. a few hours in a car and then you're getting out the other end consistently, it definitely has an impact on you physically, mentally, and and your ability to fish up sort of the best of your ability on a venue like that where you need to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think I think the. F- the first year you've still got that buzz for it, but when it when it uh, it fizzles out a little bit after, mm. it just becomes uh, you know you you're just going through the motions a bit after uh, after that initial burst of excitement of the new water. Yeah. Uh, the bait company. What 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 ultimately happened with regards to that? Because obviously it grew in popularity. A lot of people using it. A lot more coverage. A lot more fish being caught on it. I could imagine that took a lot of toll on you, but I could imagine it put you into a bit of a crossroads with it all eventually, didn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it just became, well, carp fishing became the job then, and it's never, it was never anything. I mean, I'm like everyone else, you, you do it for the enjoyment, don't you? Uh, and I was kind of losing focus on the, cl- on the, on the carp fishing a bit by then and uh, having to talk about it every day. With people, uh, I mean, no disrespect to any of my customers. I, I was one of them at one point where all I wanted to do was talk about carp fishing, but there was a point where I'd had enough of it, really. So I just uh, sold the business on and went into uh, industrial rope access. So before that, that was work, was it? Was there another job at the side of it, or were you, was it just bait rolling? What, bef- before, before the bait? Before the rope climbing, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the the bait I started doing, oh God, mid 2000s, mm-hmm. uh, like 05, something like that, right through to, I think I got rid of it about 2018. And uh, I was, because bait's seasonal. Mm. I got my rope tickets. I was doing a bit of the rope access through the winter. Uh, so that was the transition. I, I just thought, ah, this is this is easier just doing a eight to five and when I go home, that's uh, work over. I don't know if it's easier <laughs> being at rope, climbing through little gaps and doing crazy stuff, mate. I'll take rolling some bait. building, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
away from Bay, Stone Acres, the end chapter, you caught Choco, you caught a few of them, you talked about sort of the travel element and the realities of having to sort of stockpile your drive. What what was, did you know after that, that sort of period of time that it was done and it was time to move on? Yeah. Yeah, I was already ready to move before I called Choco. I was, I was getting itchy feet. I, I, I was there was a lot more big fish appearing up north again by this point. So I was I, I wanted to do a bit of fishing up north, closer to home. Oh, yeah, uh, limit the travel until till I was ready again. There was a venture down south to somewhere pretty special, mate. That being the Mere. Talk yeah. to me about about that because that. <clears throat> At the moment, with regards to your angling, it's been very much, okay, there has been big fish present, and that's been a key factor, big fish, not little ones, not numbers, not numbers of runs, not busy nights, but big fish. Heritage has obviously been in there with these big fish, but there hasn't really been the sole sort of, what I would say is tracking down one carp target element to it it's been in there if it catches it brilliant and obviously it becomes a target along the way but it hasn't been a real drive for one fish the mere and this is only coming across to me my perception externally of it is very much a one fish campaign target yeah yeah well prior to that after stoneacre i went on to goldendale and that that was for the exactly as you say it was it was just a one fish water uh, you were going on there for the for that big common in there. You catch that common? Yeah, co- yeah, caught him. Yeah. How quickly? Uh, in the, uh, about fourteen nights, I think something like that. Yeah, we we're just doing forty-eight hour sessions through the spring, and then caught him in June. <sighs> uh, but mate. tiny little water, tiny little lake. But it's not uh, easy, mate. That lake. No, no, not easy. What no, was the mean, key there? I've seen people spend a long time on there after that. Yeah, yeah, it's. It, it it was it was absolutely stuffed with silkweed. There was tons of it on the bottom, mm. uh, and it was sort of billow up to about five feet in height. And it was it was random. You know, one bit you could land in was two foot, and then a couple of feet to the left, it could be five or six feet high. Uh, so and it was quite dense and matted stuff. It was horrible stuff. You know, it's like silkweed. It just wraps around everything. Uh, so I decided to just fish. Uh, Chods on there, chods with little one ounce tri lobes, so mm. they didn't sit too deep into it. And I thought I'll just cast to show in fish because they like to show on there. Uh, keep the bait going in around the lake, so they were always eating it. Just fish corkers, chuck to uh, shows. Bright ones or match the hatch ones? Uh, yeah, just yeah, just match the hatch corkers on your GLM yeah, on concoctions. GLM corkers, yeah. Wow, mate! I have known people spend a long time after that common. It, 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 it was a really good te- tactic because I caught every trip and caught most of the fish in there before I caught the, the common. It was, uh, I think it was only 12 or 15 fish in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, was the, what was the weight of the common? Uh, 42 and a half. Like a big fat cruising carp he was. Mate, but from that water, that's, that's a special fish that is, mate. Yeah, yeah Pride of Stoke, that one. I love yeah. that. It's a big one. Still going? No, gone, no. Long yeah. gone? Uh, don't know about that long. Yeah. But it went, it went, it sort of receded back in weight to mid-30, I think, or low 30. Died in recent years. I love how you just nudged that one in the middle of all this, mate. That's, <laughs> a, that's a mega one. Yeah, well, that was one that, you know, I knew lads, a bit, the likes of Miles had spent yeah. a few seasons on and off on there. Uh, so you never know how long you're going to be on there. So you just... <laughs> For you, there is that three-year period that you've talked about before, but for quite a lot of these venues, there seems to be <clears throat> quite a concentrated period of effort into each one. It's not like you're doing two nights, having, let's say, a week off, and then you seem to be very concentrated when, when you're on that place, yeah, you're on it. when I'm yeah. on it, I'm on it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of what... I'm not one of these that can just turn up and knock the biggest fish out the le- out the lake, uh I have to put a concerted amount of effort in uh, and knowledge for the water and build up a pattern, a mental pattern of what's going on so you can make decisions off that, really. Fair, mate, fair days. You've been very successful, mate. I think you're doing yourself a disservice there. You've not caught them first session, but you've definitely caught them. Um, the mere, mate. You said you had that little brief, brief, 
mega result um, with that comment. And then... And then, yeah, and then uh, I think it was Lee Petty that talked me into it. I knew he was going on. He says, just, you've got to just have a go, mate, because these things aren't around forever. I thought, yeah, he's right. Sod it. I'll come and have a go on the mere. So uh, went down that spring, met Gaz Farah. Uh, he met up with me and we had a walk around it together and uh, sort of made plans for the season. What did you think when you walked around there? Uh, it was pretty much... Everything people described uh, was a bit simpler to get into than people made out. Okay, uh, it's, it's a well established lake now, so uh, there was little paths all the way around it. it. wasn't quite as quite the rabbit warren it probably used to be. Mm. Uh, yeah, interesting lake. Uh, seeing them from the word go. Quite, which was quite surprising. They weren't, they weren't that difficult to find or uh, suss out the patterns. So, what did you glean from from that in terms of patterns? Well, <laughs> there was a couple of areas in the middle they like to show in the mornings, which was the obvious place to fish for them, and then they'd just bugger off into a couple of the overhanging trees for the day, sun themselves, and then be back out there in the morning again. It was a uh, Simple as that, really. What was that in the middle? Just a safe zone, if anything. No, it wasn't just... safe. It's only ninety yard out. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not the widest of lakes. No, I suppose it's not. Yeah. No. So you fishing there first time, first session. What, what was the yeah, plan? Head uh, to that middle zone, try and try. Well, and... I think I, think I might have just seen one there that time. I started early April, so it was still a bit cold. Uh, there weren't wasn't much uh, leaf growth out by then. I think I caught a couple of tench early on. Uh, and then as, as as the weather started to improve, you were starting to see a few more. Uh, the first time, one of the first fish I saw was the myth, mythical big common. Mm, was it? Yeah, yeah. How it big was, are you putting that at then? Well, it was hard to say because I didn't have any anything to go off, as in I hadn't watched any of the other fish close up. Uh, I, I just I saw it bow waving uh, parallel to me along the bank about 15 yards out and it turned and came towards me and got to about rod length or two out and it was it was this colossal wide common I thought Jesus Christ that looks that looks like a 50 mm -hmm. and then I watched it for a little bit more uh, I thought well, upper 40, 50 I don't know hard to say uh, and then two weeks later I was watching the Black Mirror, and I thought that oh, common was bigger than that. Joke, <laughs> and that sort of like hit home then when I saw the Black Mirror. But it was an odd one, the Black Mirror. It, it never really, never really looked fifty. What it, in the yeah, water? Yeah, you, you could be mistaken thinking it was like a forty-two pounder or something like that. Uh, I don't know whether that's because it's just solid muscle, mm. but yeah, for some reason it didn't look enormous. So realistically. You're putting that common, what, mid fifty? Some other people, 60? other people have always said it was mid fifty. Uh, I, I wouldn't argue with them. It was definitely fifty plus. Jeez. Oh, if, I mean, if the black mirror was fifty two, yeah, that was bigger. It's the angling on there, mate. Talk to me. Any, any, any specific sort of um, focus? I know that it was. There was obviously a lot of people fishing it, and I'd imagine you'd have seen a lot of other people fishing it. In terms of being competitive, you've obviously had to streamline down your gear. You've had to do everything that everybody else has had to do in terms of that. But what edge do you, do you think you had? Did you have any edges? Uh, I wouldn't have thought so. Amongst the quality of anglers that were on there, uh, you've just got to be as mobile as possible, uh, Keep your eyes peeled and just try and be on fish the majority of the time. That's that's all you could do, really. Who did you see on there, mate? Who was fishing? Uh, Daryl Peck was on there at the time. Daryl was on. Uh, Petty was on. Uh, Briggsy. Uh, who else was on there? Daryl Style. Uh, oh, there, was, there was a fair few on there. Mad Martin, he was there. Uh, 
the who's who, mate, yeah. really. You yeah, know, there's there a lot of top yeah, anglers. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a few coming and going on there. You catch anything, you get a bite? Yeah, I'd, uh, the first take I had, I lost. I, uh, oh. I think it was end of April. Uh, they were showing out in the middle section again. I saw two of the decent commons come out and a smaller common. I'd just had my rod propped up at the time when one of these had come out. So I was like, ah, oh, that'll do. <laughs> dropped it right in, dropped it right into the rings. And uh, What do you have on the end? Oh, this was just a, a chod. Yeah, chod. Okay. Cork ball chod. That's all I fished in the spring. I thought, I'll just fish single up baits mm. and uh, get my head round the lake and what they're up to and formulate a plan from there. Uh so I just dropped this into the rings. An hour later, it was it was off like a train was attached to the end of it. Uh, took took a bit of line, weeded me up. I didn't think there was any weed in the lake at the time. The week before, it had been nothing. It weeded me up, so I just put held it in compression for a while, no movement. Uh, put the rod down for a bit, no movement. Should have gone and got a boat from mm. somewhere. Uh, Sort of leant into it again for another 10 minutes and boom, the rig come back. Uh, and then the next week, I had one. I had a takeoff. I can't remember what it was called. One of the first swims you come to. Uh, and uh, this time it weeded me up solid. I knew there was quite a bit of weed there then. So I just went straight round, got a dinghy out of the bushes went out, cranked this thing up, and it was the twisty mouth. Uh, and then and then, then Steve, uh, Steve had the, the big, uh, Steve had the black mirror in, in June. That's right, World Cup, wasn't it? World yeah, Cup. World Cup, yeah, yeah. I'd, I was sat, sat watching the World Cup and I got the message through that, that Steve had had it. Uh, I, I well deserved, Steve had had uh, quite a few fish out of there. Uh, Get up, pretty th- what a boy. Through, yeah, through the spring, we were saying how it hadn't been out, and there'd been there'd been a few captures. I mean, only like I don't know six captures. And Steve was saying, <clears throat> "It's not right that it's usually out in 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 the first couple of captures, the Black Mirror." Uh, and then about a week after that, I was I was watching it in this bush, and I saw a little nick on the side of it on the wrist of its tail. Uh, a bit of white flesh exposed. This is typical of when uh, typical of when lead core or line just catches them in a fight. Mm. I thought it's been lost. He's down there sulking, and I found out Daryl had lost one a few days earlier, oh, and it, it just made sense that uh, he'd been lost. And then, and then June, uh, Briggsy had him, <sighs> and then it, uh, then the algae bloom kicked in. Wow. Mate, and that was uh, that was the end of the year. So you literally within after. a year, well, your year, isn't it? That's you done. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I think it was July. It all went tits up. Yeah. Well, how did you get that news? Were you on? You weren't on at the no, time. No, I wasn't on. Petty had just got there. He says I've just got on the lake and fucking fish are floating dead. Uh, I says you're joking me. He says yeah, I think. Uh, so I think Martin's found the mirror. Uh, was that whole story about them putting it out in a sack, wasn't there? Yeah, that's it, sinking it in a sack in the lake. Yeah. Yeah, but they, they said everything was dead, you know, eel, yeah. eels, uh, fry, uh, all sorts of water life. Often the way, though, when, it, when, it, when you get an, a lot of a big oxygen crash, those sort of, you yeah, your perch, your pike, your delicate fish go first and then it goes on. But if your eels are going and stuff like that, mate, it's not good, is oh, it? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. It, it, it never happened before because it's always been a lake nut. That's been noted for having bad algae blooms. Why is that? I don't know. I think it's to do with just, know. yeah, I don't know, the makeup of the of whatever silt's yeah, there or whatever's, re- yeah, whatever organic o- matter. Massive there. oxygen crash. Apparently, it's when uh, when you get heavy rains or thunderstorms, it just pushes that, that algae down through the layers and it depletes the oxygen mm. as it goes through. And it's quite a deep lake as well, on average. Uh, That's a gutter, mate, isn't it? What, what, from that point when that sort of thing happens, because you're on there to catch it, as is everybody else, What what's your 
What's your plan B? Because I suppose you haven't really got a plan B, have you? No, there wasn't really. Uh, it kind of, uh, it kind of, it, it just left me a bit empty. I, I kind of, re- there was only really fish I wanted to catch. I g'd myself up so much for uh, for catching that fish uh, over over whatever time period it had taken. Mm. Uh, didn't really have my eye on anything else. It's almost like the start of me. Losing the the, uh, Drive, the, the bug, yeah, the bus, for, bug yeah. for the carp fishing, I think. Yeah. Where did you end up? Did you go back up north? Yeah, just started pottering about on some waters up north. Got a got a ticket for uh, a local lake, a local syndicate in Manchester, uh, fishing for the half lin. That was in the, the that was that was the target fishing there. Another target fish. You're talking about dead man's. Dead man's, yeah. Catch it? Yeah, caught that. Uh, got a winter ticket on there, so uh, we started in November. Uh, that's when we were allowed to go on there. Uh, Chris got a ticket as well. Uh, so yeah, went in. Uh, went in with the maggot. It just looked like a a good lake for it. It was. Why did you say that? Why did it look like a good lake for well, the it maggot? It didn't look like it had any silvers in. No. We weren't seeing anything dappling around the edges or. Rings on the surface. Uh, I know it's. I don't really like using loads of maggots in the uh, overly silty waters. I knew it was fairly hard bottom lake, like a gravel pit. I was pretty sure it hadn't been done before, and uh, <clears throat> it's a brilliant winter tactic. Mm-hmm. So i was just putting a putting a gallon a gallon a week in there. Uh, just going down with catty and firing them out about ten yard. Off some bushes, uh, so I'd go. To, I'd, I'd do two nights, but I'd go down the night before and put them all in. So I'd put like most of it in and just leave a a, pi- a, yeah, a pint yeah. for the, for fishing with. You fish them on the hook. Yeah, fished them on the hook. Yeah, just, uh, two, bought, two, just two, maggots, no, no. Sorry. I fished, I fished a bait, uh, fished a boilie off the spot to the left, uh, and then. Two uh, two rods on on the maggot on the hook. Uh, was catching well on them from the word go, <clears throat> and catching the odd one on the on the rod off the spot. Uh, and then I was I was catching a lot of the smaller stockies, so I thought I'll put one of the rods on on a boilie on the spot, see if that uh, improves anything. I was I was all. From the word go, when I started baiting, I was introducing about a pound of oilies in with it. Okay. Like 12 millies. Uh, whole baits, not... not yeah, whole baits. Up, no? Yeah, whole baits, whole small baits. Bird foods, a cranberry bird food. Mm. Uh, and then it, that, and I think, and that's what I ended up having him on. I had him the on boilie. The, the bottom bait boilie rod, yeah. Over the maggot, yeah. It's funny that they talk about big carp and and sort of their greediness and and you've said it before in terms of yeah those sort of lead fish the big ones that sort of dictate feeding but a boilie can often just single them out can't it mm. you might be getting bites like you're saying on the maggot. I really but... thought he'd come to the the, the boilie off the spot as if he'd mm. sort of hang back a bit, uh, but no straight off the spot. How big was half limb? Forty four. Oh, that's a mega one, mate. Yeah. Nice, Another uh, Northwest history job, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you did, I think, as a sort of a, and we're going to talk about the chapter and, and sort of more relevant stuff to now, but you did venture down again to a complex that, well, certainly now, but in recent times has really sort of etched its place in, in carp fishing history, which is Dinton, didn't you? Yeah, we, we me and Chris got black swan tickets. Uh we ended up with a winter ticket. I don't know why they were doing them at that time. I think it might have been, I don't know, probably the council just needing an extra, an extra boost or something. But they did, uh, they did a, they did a, a number of winter tickets that that winter. So we got this winter ticket, and uh, I think we had a couple of trips in the December. Saw a shitload of fish. Yeah, showing in between the uh, islands. Off, uh, I can't remember what the peg numbers were, uh, and Paul, uh, Paul Forward had had the big common that autumn at fifty one. Wow! Like that. So that was the first fifty it had done. Uh, then 
we went. I think Chris had done a couple of trips in the February. Uh, I did a tri- did I do a trip in the Feb. Might have done a trip in the February. Then we did a trip together in in the beginning of March, and it was like he, he twisted my arm to go down. I just couldn't be asked. Why? <clears throat> I don't know. I just <clears throat> wasn't feeling it. And the, the thing was, I knew that uh, Black Swan was the perfect water for me. I knew we were catching it on the cusp of it becoming a mega water because we knew how fast they were growing. We knew there were fish that hadn't been out for a few years. It had a big stock. There was a lot of fish in there. Yeah. Uh, it was all building towards, yeah. And it was boats, but casting. Mm. And you could go and put blocks in. And no one was doing it. No one was fishing it like we used to on Stone Acres. And it was exactly the same. You were allowed to do all the same things. <clears throat> so we thought, God, this is uh, it's ripe for the picking, this. But my my enthusiasm was just waning. I knew it was a ticket for life as well. I thought, yeah. well if I was into it, you know, this is the place to be. Uh, so he convinced me to come down and do this session at the beginning of uh, March. It was a grim old week, hail, cloudy all week, fucking cold. Uh, and I started in the swim where we'd seen all these fish in the December. Chris was down in the in the bay. Uh, and I was just like, fuck this. I'm bored. Uh, says, I'm coming down for someone to talk to, if now else. So I went and moved in the swim next to him. Uh, and then woke up in the morning. I looked out to where I'd put the rigs, set of rings. I thought, oh, that'll do nicely. So I'm sat there, makes a brew, gets up. What are then another one shows? Another one. And I've, by nine o'clock, I'd probably seen 15 shows over my rods. I'm starting to think, are they tangled? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then one rips off. So I play this one in, it put up a right battle. I took about 70 or 80 yard line, uh, netted it. I looked down, I could see it was, it was a, you know, a good 30 plus fish. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it's that time of year, it's winter, you know, that your margins for catching, a, it's a small window, isn't it? Yeah. So I just unhooked him in the net. Looks, the pop ups are all right. These were just uh, little white pop ups we were using. Slung it straight back to the spot. Uh, put the rod back on the rest, got the fish out, weighed it, uh, weighed it, photographed it. I was just slipping it back. The bobbin had, on the rod had recast, just hit the deck. So it's like, I just let go of, just let go of this carp and put it, it into this thing. And it, uh, I'd seen a few small fish show over me, like singles, oh, like right. singles. And that's all this thing felt like. It's like da, 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 da. Gets it right up into the edge. Still felt like a, a single. Next minute, the big common just pops up in front what? of me. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, uh, one of my mates uh, who was opposite came over. <clears throat> just as was net. And it was like, you're not going to believe what's in the net here, mate. Uh, it's that big common, poor forward, dad. So I thought to myself, I've got 50 plus common in the yeah, net here. Yeah. Uh, it turned out to be 47 or 48. Irrelevant though, tough yeah, fish, but you know. yeah, yeah, that dint back common, yeah, biggest in the lake. Couldn't believe it, you know. You and it did nothing. It looks like nothing. it would just beat yeah, the yeah, life out yeah, of you. Just came in like a tench. Yeah, few of them, aren't you? <laughs> Talk to me about, and this is a big moment. You talked a little bit there about being convinced to go to the session. You talked a little bit about your enthusiasm for it waning. What was the ultimate moment where you pulled off and subsequently you haven't been back? Talk to me about that. Because well, I, I went back on to, <clears throat> ended up getting a, a full ticket that year. Mm. And I think I did, I did half a dozen trips through the spring. I had a few. Uh, and then didn't fish it in the summer. Uh I think I did a trip in the October and that that could well have been the last time I carp fished. Uh, just didn't end up going back down there or anywhere else. It's hard for me 
to think of a bloke who's been as committed as you have to big carp fishing, not just going for a few bites, not chilling out with his mates, having a bit of a booze or a social or whatever. I mean, proper up there in the carp scene to then go in. Nah, that seems like a, yeah. yeah. As I've said before to you, I'm kind of all or nothing. And I can only sort of focus on one task in hand. Uh, That's always been the way with me. And, I'd kind of got the bug for the uh, for the climbing, and that just it just transitioned into that, and that took over. And uh, how did you get the climbing bug, mate? Did somebody take you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a uh, it, it was my mate Ray who uh, who I was fishing with on Sto- he was fishing on Stone Acres with me on the third season. I'd known Ray on and off since uh, God, first time I met him was on Reeds me. Uh, good. Predator Ray's best mate, Ray Bell. Uh, I did a little bit on Top Flash with him. Mm. And then we fished on Lynch a bit together. And he said, he said, why don't you come climbing with me? He said, you can obviously climb, so you're shinning up trees. He said, you might enjoy it. Uh, so bought a set of climbing shoes. And that was that. Went out for a few trips with him. and uh, that was, uh, That's a great edge from Ray, isn't it, mate? I'd have paid Ray good money to get you off my syndicate. <laughs> get him off. <laughs> Take him to a earlier. climbing wall. That's, yeah, that is great. In terms of that whole process, obviously, climbing's taken over. You said you're all or nothing. You're all focused in climbing. That is your passion. You get the same buzz. We talked about this at the very start of the podcast. At no point in that period of time between your last fishing session, getting involved in climbing, climbing and rope stuff being work do you do you get an urge a, a sort of a I don't know a, a, an inkling that you just want to go back fishing uh, no uh, but you kind of you've still got those carp angler senses like this time of year in May you know it's mad May isn't it you walk out and you feel that temperature change you know it's uh, like first week of May it's time beyond the bank isn't it you might have you might not be, but you can't. You, as an angler, you'd never go. I'm going to walk on the lake at first week of May. No, you'll you'll struggle through March and April <laughs> and, wa- and watch yeah, it yeah. become deep, become decent at the, uh, the beginning of May every time. Uh, that was the thing about Stoneacre when the likes of Terry Earn turned up. We just walked on the first week of May. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not fucking about with all that. I just walked on Court Choco the first week. Job he was done. on there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. That's a classic big fish angler, eh? You know it, don't you? But I, I can't believe that you don't get the the sort of, I don't so know. I'll go, I'll go out on a day like that and go, oh, there's been a wind change. You know, and uh, you, you still feel that s- warm southerly and think... Yeah, they'll be getting on the end of that somewhere. Yeah. What about, like, because obviously, I mean, it's difficult. You, you you moved, you're over in, like, Wales now, the, probably the access and stuff to fishing. Do you even keep to date with the carp scene or anything like that? Uh, only tends to be through mates you're following. Like, there's mm. only a select few I'll, I'll follow because I don't want my feed full of carp on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. But your friends that I follow, you know, you kind of get an idea of what's going on. I was talking with you before and hearing what some waters are doing. You know, I'm not aware of that. <laughs> you, mate, we're dragging so, you back, boy. Do you reckon you'll go back to it? Eh, I say never, say never. Yeah. And you Maybe said to one me, day. You said to me before, like, a, a good climbing day is a terrible angling day. So you, you wouldn't ever think of mixing the two because it's all or nothing, yeah? Well, probably, I'd probably not. I, I could probably do mix the two, but I'd probably... My climbing had suffer and I'd catch fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. When when you think about sort of the future for you, is it geared around what you've got or what you've developed as a life, which is you live in a, a very nice area if you're a climber, you've got a lot of climbing in abundance. It's essentially being like <laughs> the Colm Valley of climbing. Uh, is it based all and around that, mate? You're happy, you're settled, yeah, your I mind's mean- at rest, you, you're done. I've I've always li- I've always been like a dog. I live in the now. I don't. I've never, mm. never planned too far ahead. Uh, so, just to see how life rolls. You know, see where it takes you. Mate, 
genuinely, I can't thank you enough for A, inviting me in here to do this, but agreeing to do it in the first place, mate. You're an incredibly humble bloke who's caught an awful lot, achieved an awful lot in carp fishing and very much undersells himself with regards to that, mate. Um, I've spoke to a lot of people, as I said before, who've always and still continue to hold you in the highest regard. So you've always got a home in carp fishing if you ever want to come back to it, mate. Um, it'd be a pleasure to one day get out on the bank with you, especially as I'm now an adopted northerner and you're, well, that's you're it, an icon. Northerner now, eh? Adopted being the yeah, operative yeah, word yeah, there, mate. Yeah. I don't do, <laughs> what is it? What's the old Wigan thing? Pie bars? Pie butty. Pie butties? Yeah. You mad, mate. It's bad enough having a pie. Two carbohydrates is the wrong end, mate, on a plate. Um, before you go, mate, I've got some quick fire questions. Okay. okay you're not prepped on these. No, not at all. So this should be good fun for my editing, probably. Yeah. <laughs> right, you ready? Go for it. Um, only, this is if you go back to fishing, only go fishing up north or only down south for the rest of your days. Don't say the Midlands. Not Leicester. No, it's a few. Not many more. Not much anymore, but there'll be the odd one. Uh, yeah, up north, probably. Yeah, back up north. Countryside. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful around here, mate. Um, one carp, one rig, one venue. They don't have to coincide with each other. One carp, if you had to pick one, <coughs> which one? I suppose it's got a bit of black mirror, hasn't it? Yeah, I'll give you that. One rig. But I suppose most people say things like that and Mary and... I thought you'd have gone for the north, mate, to be honest, but I'll let you off now. There's too many that got away. That's the problem. <laughs> the Black Mirrors are good in that. I'll tell you what. No, I'll, tadpole linear from Farmwood. Really? Yeah. That seems obscure. It is obscure. Why is that? Why is it? Just an incredible looking yeah, carp okay. and it only weighed 27 pounds. I'll give you that one. Very obscure, but I'll give you it. Uh, drum and bass or country and western? Uh, country and Western. Bit of the Eagles or something. Uh, it's not quite country I, and Western, but... I like that, mate. It's good enough. It's good enough. Um, never climb again or never fish again? Well, never fish again. That needs to change, doesn't it? That's absolutely <laughs> wrong. Three celebrities you'd like to take fishing? Oh, Christ. Christ? Jesus yeah, Christ? Yeah. It'd be good one, mate, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah, any other fictional characters I can think of. Uh, <laughs> Don't get political yeah, on this podcast, boy. <laughs> What's a celebrity climber? That's not that really boring. Spider-Man. Uh, yeah, Spider-Man. <laughs> He's dead going to climb yeah. it. <laughs> I don't know. Schwarzenegger. I bet he'd be entertaining, wouldn't he? <laughs> get to the chopper. <laughs> yeah, he'd just do Arnie, Arnie uh, impressions. All. Uh. That'd be good banter. I wouldn't want to feed him, though. No. He wouldn't survive on a pot noodle, would he? <laughs> I was going to say, mate. <laughs> Even with half a loaf dipped in. Arnie, we're going to the mirror. Can't take a lot, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably could with a mid luggy gear, wouldn't you? It'd be good for that. Yeah, it'd be a good Sherpa, wouldn't he? <sighs> Big old Sherpa. What are you going for then? Arnie, I'll yeah, give you that. Yeah, we'll go for Arnie. Why not? You need three. Three? Yeah. Oh, I forgot. I know. Ollie Reed, we can have a drink. Yeah. Yeah, <sighs> yeah that's a drink. One more. Yeah, laugh, you know. Colin McRae. Colin McRae. <laughs> Why are two of them dead? What? <laughs> Why? Oh, yeah. two... It's throwback. Colin McRae. He'd get you to the lake quick, though, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. He could. Uh, yeah, he could drive us there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what a social that would be. Um, what's your idea of carp fishing? Hell. Carp fishing? Hell. <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, yeah Come the on, whole mate. thing. Back fishing. Uh, uh, carp fishing? Hell. Yeah. What would be the worst be, thing be you can running imagine? bait. Bait firm again. <laughs> the bait firm again. <laughs> I think that's gone. Answering the phone. Anybody yeah. looking back for some throwback bait mixes, you might be struggling. I'll give you that. Uh, carp fishing hell would be uh, a busy day ticket water. Well, yeah, busy day ticket. Braze nose or something like that. Throw in some bait boats all over me and crossing me. <laughs> I'll probably do it. I'll give you that. Best bit of advice you've ever been given. Uh, wherever you see them at first light is probably where you need your rigs. Very nice. Um, modern day venue that you'd fish or you'd like to fish if you could. Uh, comes back to me being out of the loop, doesn't it? Uh, you, we talked about a place before <clears throat> with biggins in it, real biggins. 
Yeah, but it was too many of them. Oh, you wouldn't? No, no. no okay. God, no. No. It's got to have none of them in it. Yes, yeah, yeah, next to nothing in it. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Yeah, low stock, big fish. Return to Tatton? Yes, yeah, yeah, go back on there. Or the Mere. Yeah, You've got two to revisit, haven't you? Well, they're in there now, aren't they? Don't yeah. tell people that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, mate. Yeah, that's spot on. Final question. Night out on the bank, night in with the missus, or night out climbing? Can you even climb at night? No, but you can sleep on the wall if you're out there long enough. There you go. Sleep. Which one are you picking? I've got to say the missus, haven't I? Yeah, nice yeah, save, I've mate. Got to keep it safe, haven't you? Rob Gillespie, you've been an absolute gent, mate. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys for watching and listening. I'll be back soon with another podcast. Until then, Rob, thank you so much, mate. Cheers, mate. Great to be here.